I need to know everything Who in the what and the where I need everything Trust me, I hear what you're saying But act like it's new what you're telling me I'm curious, George, I hop in the Porsche with five and a horse, I'm ready for war, I'm coming for... Hello and welcome to JK Plus One. We're doing another video version. We had so much fun last time, why not do it again? Uh, brought a couple of friends along uh, to watch the Travers broadcast from 2020. It was obviously an, an epic day. We, we had a more epic day, but we'll get into that later. But this was the second most epic day of our summer. But I wanted to uh, welcome a couple of my guests um, one you've seen before. The other one is not Brad Cox, even though you think you might have seen him. Uh, we'll, we'll go with the Brad Cox lookalike first. Terrence Thiege is our producer on the uh, one of our head producers on the on the Fox shows on the Nair broadcast, and uh, was the guy that was in charge of this year and last year's Travers show. We'll talk about what that means uh, with him being involved. T, what's going on? Uh, not much, Jonathan. Thanks for having us. Um... Excited to do this. I know you tried to get me to do it over the summer at Saratoga, and I was a little resistant, but uh, now that things have calmed down, I'm glad to do it. In other words, the show didn't suck. The Travers <laughs> didn't suck, so now yeah. we're going to come back and, like, like you know, be <laughs> Yeah, he wanted to do it the week of Travers and completely <laughs> jinx our show. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> Plus, we were a little busy that week. The, the other person who uh, – yeah, a little bit. The other person that uh, chimed in, you've you've seen him before. You've heard his uh, his the luscious tones of his voice for years. Uh, LP three Lafitte Pinkai the third. LP, what's popping? What's going on, man? This is gonna be a blast. It's gonna be fun. We get to take the viewers behind the curtain a little bit. But this is your second video podcast. Like who? Like who was first? Uh, Marshall Graham, all you have to do is snap me out of a hundred thousand and I put you on a video podcast. So, uh, after the, the breeders cut betting challenge, we, we did a little, I can, uh, I can, I can, I can deal with that. I can deal with Marshall. That's fine. Yeah. So I had hinted earlier that this was the second most epic day. I think it's important to, to note that yes, as we we're busy a lot in Saratoga, but I'm very proud of one day we had in Saratoga where we went to Druthers at noon and we did not leave until eight o'clock. Yeah, and there might have been another stop after that, I think, right? <laughs> Lafitte went home. Lafitte went home. We wrote like, it like out to the period. I finally had to check out. I don't know how much later that went on. That that was, yeah, that, that was an, an epic day of um, for uh, a summer that was spent for the most part, you know, indoors or socially distanced, not a lot of outings. Um, that, that was a good afternoon. With this December weather, so, I'm missing that. Uh, I'm missing that summer patio at Druthers, though. I can tell you that. I tell you what, man. I, I watched the broadcast uh, before we did the show, just to kind of have an idea of some things I wanted to talk about. And man, I just kept thinking to myself, I can't wait to get back there. I can't <laughs> wait to get back there. The weather, it's still, it's actually nice here. So not to rub that in, Lafitte. You're, I'm sure it's nice where you are as well. But um, if you're listening on the audio version, is because there will be an audio version only of this. You're you're probably better off pausing that and and, and waiting till you get to a YouTube and watching it on YouTube. But it, if you want to listen to it anyways, forgive us for talking about things that you're not going to be able to see. But uh, the plan is for us to just you know obviously we'll as long as tech cooperates. The plan is we're going to just kind of watch the show as we go. Um, we'll pause it if we need to to talk about some stuff um, to get some behind the scenes on what's going on on the show, uh, try to point out some mistakes that maybe you guys noticed or didn't notice when you were watching it live for the first time. And uh, we'll just see how it unfolds. We'll see where it goes. But the first thing I wanted to ask is uh, the week of a big show like that, obviously Lafitte also does work with the NBC broadcast covering the Breeders' Cup and doing um, uh, the Kentucky Derby and the Triple Crown. And then and Terrence has obviously been involved in, in, in horse racing for some time. Terrence, what, what is your week like uh, for a big show like this that you are producing? Yeah. So th this is bigger than any show we do all year and any show I've ever done in my career. And, uh, thankfully our bosses, Tony and, uh, Eric, they, uh, they actually that week take me off all the other shows, uh, which the first year when they said, Hey, we're going to take you off all the other shows so you can focus on the Traverse. I kind of rolled my eyes and I was like, well, that seems a bit excessive. Like yeah, it, that, must, it must be nice. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that, that, is that really necessary? And I quickly found out it, absolutely is necessary. Um, you put in as much, if not more work focused on that one show for that week than you do when, you know, in a normal week, I might produce 12 hours of shows throughout the week, uh, on three or four given days. Um, so you get taken off all the other shows and a uh, quick shout out to our other producers, Evan Schwartz and Bobby Klatt, who, uh, pick up all that slack that week and put in double time while I'm focusing on the Traverse show. Um, 
but you spend, I would say about two weeks getting ready for it. Once the uh, probable list becomes a little more solidified and you know, who's actually running in the race, uh, you know, this past year we knew Tis Law was running, but all the other contenders started filtering in. We knew who was coming, and uh, Lafitte and I met uh, about a week to 10 days out of the show, and you start talking about story ideas, interviews, um, what are some of the high points you want to hit, um, uh, what kind of historical aspects you want to look back on, uh, and then you meet with um, – it's kind of strange. I, I didn't realize until we did this show how many people you actually have to meet with to do this. Like, for instance, you meet with, uh, I believe his name is Sal in the jocks room. Uh, you meet with the people at plant and you you have to coordinate times for the jockeys. What um, This year we did a jockey intro thing where uh, we videotaped them the week of saying what horse they were on. And you'll see it when we watch the broadcast, what horse they were on um, uh, and uh I think it was where they were from. And we had to shoot all that beforehand. So you have to coordinate that. Uh, you meet with the people from plant to get like a stage built at the end of the track to put a camera on uh, for that shot we have down the stretch, which we don't have on a normal broadcast. So there's just a lot of bells and whistles that you don't think about, or at least I don't think about for the other, you know, 50 weeks of the year. But uh, for that week, those two weeks, uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Lafitte, obviously you work hand in hand with Terrence uh, when it comes to, to to the reads and just kind of uh, you're the point guard out there um, and, and he's essentially the coach. What, what is your involvement in, in the week of leading up to one of these big shows? It's all it's all communication, like Terrence had mentioned. And, and the, the, the truth is, aside from being you know, friends for more than a decade, Terrence and I have worked together a lot. Uh, he was my producer back at HRTV on the Pursuit series, the Pursuit of the Cup, the Pursuit of the Crown, all of the Breeders' Cup and Triple Crown preview shows that we did. So I think there's a, a familiarity there. Um, the anticipation and, as you mentioned, understanding all the storylines going in, obviously that's that's key um, for my role as the host, just always knowing, always knowing what's next and that familiarity with the rundown. Um, you know, know your audience, uh, understanding that much like an NBC broadcast, this is a Fox audience and, and you never want to talk down to anyone, but you want to make sure that if you kind of veer into a conversation where there is some technical lingo, like explain exactly what that is, because viewers who don't follow on a day to day basis, um, they're not going to know what the hell you're talking about, you know, and, and it makes it that much more difficult for them to follow the storylines and, and giving them a reason uh, to care, a reason uh, to watch. Um, so really that, that familiarity with the rundown going in, I think is probably, uh, most important. And then just taking a, a step back, big picture, you mentioned some of the crew here, the idea of, of what, not just Travers day, but this entire summer, you know, what was pulled off by the, the Naira crew an undermanned Naira crew. There were much less people this year at Saratoga than there were last year. So you're talking about an undermanned Naira crew who's producing a 90 minute show on, on big, on big Fox. Um, that's, it's an incredible, you know, it's a big challenge and, and there's, while three of us are here discussing it, you know, so many, um, that it put in so many long hours that are so talented, uh, that made, that made the broadcast itself possible. You talk about, uh, your preparation and I actually just thought about this. It kind of feels a lot like a race caller where, We've heard Tom Durkin and Larry Colmus and Travis Stone talk about how they prepare for a bunch of scenarios. They work out things in their brain and, and things that they could say if this happens. And then when it when when those moments come up, you just hope that they happen. How do you prepare um, for a show like this? Because on Friday and on Thursday before the show, I was trying to get you to go to Slavo with me. And every time you said no. So I want to understand what it was you were actually doing that was so important. Like, I don't remember the invite, but that's probably like, you know, conversation for another for another day. Um, for myself, there, there's parts of the show that horse racing is is difficult to cover in terms of television. When you have one track, what we do at Saratoga, you know, race one is over 28 minutes to post until race number two. We don't have three other tracks we're covering. Right. So so, you know, Terrence has his hands full like you need production value. It's not a matter of a quad split where you don't need a producer or a host. You need air traffic control and a traffic guard. That That's pretty much it, just to kind of keep track of the live races and prices and post parades, and that's it. You don't have to worry about filling that time. So when you only have a couple minutes of action um, every half hour or so, 
all of that needs to be pre-produced. So you're talking about someone of a studio show, a lot of which does need to be written. Certainly the scene set at the very top. Um, you have to go in knowing what you're, for as a host, I've always thought that it's more important to know what the questions are to be asked as opposed to what the answer to every question is. Keep it really, really concise. And all that comes together with the planning and the familiarity of the rundown and going from element you know, A to B to C. That's, that's really the most important. As far as what a track announcer may do once a horse crosses the wire, that's all reaction. First thing that comes to mind, like I'm never gonna plan what I'm gonna say when a horse even an expected, like a tis the law and odds on favorite, what he says once he crosses the wire. But um, because there's so little action in horse racing and so much time to fill, a lot of, of the planning that goes in is the anticipation of, of what you're gonna say to transition, certain questions for your analysts and reporters, that, that kind of thing. T, talk a little bit about the rundown. That that was the thing that I, I think that, you know, when I, the first time I was fortunate enough to be on the show and seeing that rundown and how there's, it's literally mapped out to the 15 seconds, sometimes the, on, the, on the Traverse show to the five to the 10 seconds. I think you guys probably get a little bit more relaxed to 15 or 25 seconds or 30 seconds on a normal show. Um, is Tell me a little bit about how you start a rundown and, and where, you know, when, you, when you're going to do a show, how do you open up your computer and where do, where do you go first when you're starting a rundown? Yeah, so the rundown is basically a, an Excel sheet that calculates the timing of all the uh, events throughout the show. As you mentioned, for our normal show, a Belmont Aqueduct or even a normal Saratoga show, we map it out at by 15 to 30 second increments, you know, especially given with horse racing, you can't be more specific than that on timing. Uh, but for the Travers show, you are more specific. It's down to, like you said, the five second increment. You know, if I tell Jonathan, he's got 45 seconds to give his pick out, that means 45 seconds or less. That doesn't mean 50, 55 a minute. Cause then that pushes everything else back. Um, as far as putting the rundown together, uh, the first thing, you know, looking at the past performances of the horses, figuring out what storylines we want to cover. Uh, well, actually, I should say first is the sponsored elements, which take priority because those, of course, are what pay the bills. So you have certain elements you have to get into the show. Even if the, you know, if the truck's on fire, what's going on, these sponsored elements have to get into the show because they're writing you a check. Uh, then there's the elements that are the storylines. Um, as Lafitte has said to me before, every horse has a story. Tell that story. Um, the reporters, whether it's Acacia, Maggie, um, Greg did an outstanding job this year uh, covering the Tis the Law aspect and the Sacatoga Stable aspect. Uh, tell that story to the viewer. If you're somebody that watches horse racing every week or every weekend, it might be redundant to you. If you're watching for the first time and you're watching that Traverse show and you're just learning who Sacatoga Stable is and who Tis the Law is, you need to get that story across to them. Not necessarily chronological. You put the races in where they go, you put the sponsored elements in where they go, and then you put in the fun elements, the packages, the stories, the features. Um, Lafitte's scene set that he talked about, uh, There's a you'll see in the show, there's a retease, uh, kind of like a second open into the show. Uh, that jockey introduction, um, the ringing of the bell at Saratoga, which is a great tradition. And despite the lack of fans this year, or lack of spectators this year, we're able to still get that tradition across in the show. Um, whatever it might be, you just kind of plug those in. I sometimes joke that it's like playing Tetris with the rundown. You're just trying to get all the pieces to fit. And, and the idea of everybody being concise and why everybody had, why it doesn't sound like a lot where it doesn't make a difference if it's, well, I went 15 seconds when I only had, you know, 10 seconds or I went 35 seconds when I only had 25. A perfect example, Terrence, remember last year, our first Travers, like Maggie's paddock report got cut because all of us collectively yeah. went a little bit heavier in certain areas than we should have. And, you know, a Travers show on Fox, and this is where, you know, her expertise is so useful because you still have the handicappers watching. And for Saratoga's marquee event, that was one element that had to be cut because of those few seconds how quickly they add up and in the end something gets cut and essentially you know and then something like that is eliminated from the show terrence um now just a little bit about your career obviously you um you're a sports fan in, in lots of different situations horse racing is dear to you um is there other sports you'd be interested in, in doing uh you know producing shows for yeah absolutely i mean uh baseball is my favorite sport of Talk to you guys about that before. Uh, I love football, love NFL and college. A um, little bit of a basketball and a uh, little bit of a soccer fan. Not not too much, but mainly baseball and football. Um, uh, 
but I would produce anything. You know, I mean, when I started at HRTV, uh, I guess now it's 2007, so about 13 years ago, um, I didn't know anything about horse racing. You, you know, I was a TV guy that studied broadcasting in at uh, Ohio University here in Athens or outside of Athens, um, and. I had to learn horse racing. So I feel like, let's say you get a job. I don't know much about hockey. Let's say I got a job producing television for hockey. I would take the time to study and learn the sport just as we did uh, uh, horse racing. You know, um, When I moved out to LA to take that job at HRTV, I literally did not know who Bob Baffert was. So uh, it's quite a, lot, uh, quite a learning curve there. Well, if he, you knew who Bob Baffert was, what, what was your transition like in the beginning of your career? Obviously you grew up around the game. Um, what, what kind of brought you to racing, uh, from a broadcast standpoint? I, I didn't want to do thoroughbred racing. Uh, my first job in television was, was covering mainstream sports, uh, in New York, uh, news 12 out of the Bronx. Uh, there was so much saturated coverage of all the professional teams. Mostly what we focused on was high school, a lot of Manhattan college, a lot of, a lot of Fordham stuff. Um, so that was, it. I wanted to do the, the baseball, basketball, football, and I've, I've said this a, a thousand times and, and and i do so with the utmost respect of the industry that this sport is like it's like the mob and me being born into it like yeah you think you're gonna get out <laughs> it pulls you back in some way somehow and, and it's i never thought i'd have this much fun working on a day-to-day -day basis or where my primary focus is horse racing and only horse racing in in television and, and sports but yeah you, you think you're gonna they're going to get outside of horse racing and somehow you wind up right, right back, right back in it. All right. Well, I think that we should, we should try to just, uh, to watch this thing and see how it goes. I, I, my plan is that we'll pause when we need to pause. We'll, we'll, uh, if something interesting is happening, I got a couple of questions some things, uh, Lafitte, uh, I got to figure out what, what the heck's up with that pin, uh, that my dad used to have at a car dealership back in 1987. Um, that's one of the questions I'll go ahead and give you a heads up on. Um, but let's, I, I say we just dive in and, and, and start watching. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and we'll listen to the open and then we'll pause it after the open and, and come back and chat about that a little bit. Okay. That'll work. Saratoga race course in Saratoga Springs, New York. Biggest day of the meet. Run Happy Travers Day. Looks different, feels different, it is different. No fans, but the horses are here. Including the New York bred Belmont Stakes winner, Tis the Law. He could still win this year's Triple Crown. That's later. Today, the one to beat in the Run Happy Travers. Trained by Barkley Tag, this isn't the first New York bred he's campaigned to great heights. Funny side, 2003 Kentucky Derby and Preakness winner. And the two-time Triple Crown winning trainer, Bob Baffert, in search of a fourth Travers win today. Armed with Uncle Chuck, light and experience, loaded with talent. This is the 151st running of the Run Happy Travers Stakes. Oh, you can pause it, Craig. So, um, my first question is, how many versions of that do you write? And the second question is, is or that maybe a question, but a statement is, I remember you telling me your process for what you did this year to try to capture that moment. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about that. Um, well, the scene set, I think what you might be referring to is the retease. Oh, where you went and sat in the stands? Right, 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 oh, okay. right. If you want to get to that later, we can get to that later. Okay, perfect. Um, I think the we're so accustomed to, it's Travers Day, big picture, massive crowd so much of what we show typically are all the are all the are all the fans there you know there are, are certain racetracks that you just associate with seeing wall-to-wall -wall fans and how loyal the fan base is it's in saratoga um uh, you have we had to take a different a different approach this year obviously and while sports is the distraction we get that but we're also documenting a live uh, event so uh, clearly the pandemic the idea that no spectators were there was going to be an overriding theme of the show it doesn't need to be the focus but you can't ignore it either and the fact that look it is different we're thrilled that the event is taking place we're fortunate that horse racing proved sustainable during a pandemic but it's still a big part of the story all 
T, what was your uh, what was your involvement with uh, the T's? Do you or, or the the Open? Do you do you just kind of let Lafitte run with it because you guys have such a good working relationship, or is this kind of a hand in hand thing where you're like, hey, here's some of the shots I'm thinking about I want to use? How does that whole thing unfold? Yeah, I mean, uh, Lafitte and I have a conversation early on in the week. He'll basically tell me this is what I'm thinking. This is what I want to do. This is uh, he calls it a scene set, but you're you're literally setting the scene, setting the table for what you're about to witness over the next hour and a half. And if a viewer is watching and happens to catch the beginning of the show, why they should stay tuned. Um, and he'll tell me what he's thinking, what he wants to write. I'll give my input. I think we need to capture, uh, you know, whatever the essence is of that moment of that hour and a half. Uh, and then after that, Lafitte kind of takes it from there. Uh, he writes it all, puts it all together, um, voices it with one of our editors. Um, and these are always actually my favorite part of not only our shows, but any sporting event I'm watching. I, I love the opens or scene sets or teases. Uh, they just get you jacked up to watch what you're about to watch. And yeah. Laf Lafitte does a great job writing it, obviously voicing it. Um, our editors do a fantastic job of shooting the footage and putting it all together for what hopefully gets people excited to watch our show. And Jonathan, that goes back to the relationship, the respect that I have for Terrence, the fact that we're friends away from the industry, away from our work. Like he has no problem telling me he thinks that something doesn't work. And I have no problem pushing back and saying, man, you're wrong. Like we've had those conversations, but nobody's feelings are getting hurt. This is television. Like there are egos involved. There can be very big egos involved. And I think having that open line of communication where feathers aren't going to get ruffled just because you have differences of opinion. Like this is as, as subjective as it gets, you know, there is no right or wrong answer, but when it comes to these types of things, it's very helpful to have another set of eyes and ears, you know, that you really trust and that, that you can have, you're not worried about hurting anybody's feelings. It's, it makes a difference. Do the images come after your voice? Like, when did you see, when do you see the images? Um, I write it, you... I submit it, I voice it, I see it after the fact. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I, they put the, they put the images on, you put yeah. the images on her, huh, T? Yeah, with, well, the editors do. Uh, one thing, I, I, I guess I missed one step there. One thing I will do is when Lafitte submits a script, he will, once he uh, submits a script to me, I can go over it with the editors and make notes of, we should use this shot here. Or, hey, uh, remember that shot we used two weeks ago of this you know, great shot of the grandstand or this great shot of Tis the Law? Let's make sure that gets in there. It needs to be here. So I will do a little bit of guidance and supervision with the editors. Uh, I try to stay as hands off as much as possible because I used to be an editor and I know how annoying that can be. Um, but we, uh, we also had a couple of freelance editors work for us this year at Saratoga and they did almost every all the editing for the Travers show and they, uh, they weren't horse racing people. So they needed that little extra guidance. They needed to know who Barkley tag was. They needed to know, uh, why do I care about this cool shot of Saratoga? So they, they were welcome to that guidance and, you know, I would kind of supervise their edit. Cool. All right. Let's let it roll. Craig. Sporting venues in North America, Saratoga Race Course in Saratoga Springs, New York. Picture perfect day for thoroughbred racing at the track they call the Spa. And welcome everyone to Saratoga Race Course. I'm Lafitte Pinkai. Normally, right now, this place would be rocking. 40, 50,000 in attendance, typically for run happy Travers. Of course, it's different without the fans, but this is still the biggest day of the meet at the most prestigious meet in North America. And the best news, the Travers will be run later this afternoon. Let's take a look at the field. The Is that all written, Lafitte? I have a pretty good idea of what I want to say at the very top. Absolutely. Um, and again, what I remember about Travers Day, maybe walking up to the set, even though we did the Travers show last year from the far turn, um, just the same on a big Saturday, where that particular set is, like you are right there on top of the people, on top of the fans. And the energy front side. In the paddock this summer, there was always some activity, so it didn't seem completely foreign. Every time we went front side, there was racing in Saratoga, and it was completely dead quiet. It was eerie in that sitting down to do a Travers show on Travers Day on Fox, and nobody's there. That, I thought, was was uh, needed to be emphasized. Did, did Terrence, this is for you and Lafitte, did you guys want that first turn set again? Do you prefer that to the one that you were in? Uh, I did. I... I didn't have a strong opinion, but I kind of wanted it. Uh, I know um, 
I know some people didn't want to see the empty grandstand necessarily behind the set, uh, even though it would be in a distance. That would be kind of accentuated with that angle of that shot. A, last year we got to rehearse a lot more because we did have that that set on the first turn. This year, we, we there was virtually no rehearsal for this show. So this was, I mean, you're talking about a serious high wire act. Um, without anybody there, I didn't mind the set being there. Um, the first turn set aesthetically is gorgeous, but having done a lot of shows out there, you're disconnected from the crowd. Um, it's really nice being able to feed off the energy typically. So next year, I think that'll be a conversation what set we use because it's nice not having to manufacture that energy without anybody there or being so disconnected from everyone the set on the finish line you you that, that to me is an advantage being able to feed off of, of you know, all the people there was it was it hard um okay so let's let's back up so last year um and i i think this is <laughs> it's okay to say this out loud last year t we canned that first segment so we actually <laughs> We actually did it and we recorded it that first segment, the first whatever, four minutes, five minutes. We actually recorded it. And so we all kind of got to take a deep breath. This year, we didn't do that. Yeah, we um, yeah, we couldn't do that this year because, um, as you see, there's a live race about to go off. So we had coverage, live coverage on it. It was either FS1 or FS2. I believe FS2 up until this show started because we were covering the live, the live racing. Last year, we were able to – we were able to, as Lafitte said, rehearse with the other set and the different talent that weren't involved with that earlier coverage. So we were able to uh, separate the two. And then as we were rehearsing, I think we rehearsed three or four times. And then finally, like the fifth time we went through the whole first segment of the show, it was perfect. Everybody nailed it. And uh, I was people clean every take. Like I was clean <laughs> every take. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, and I remember, I think it was... Uh, I think it was Pete Macheska, the Fox producer, said something. He's like, done, can it? Like, he's like, that it's not going to get any better than that. So we just took that recorded rehearsal segment and aired it live. So the first, I think it was closer to about eight minutes. That first eight minutes of the show last year was actually recorded about 15 minutes prior to airtime. It was an hour show, Terrence, right? And we only had the the, the Travers, and the, that was the only race. Yep. It, was, it was the only race. It was an hour show. The first eight or nine minutes was canned. The final 30 minutes is unscripted because it's all live coverage of the racing. So really, we had about 20, 30 minutes of, and you take commercials out, way less than that. We only had a limited time of the show to actually worry about uh, creating live content for. Now, um, obviously, you know, having a longer time on Fox is always a positive. And, you know, like you said, last year, we only did one race this year. We were fortunate enough to do three. I, I you know, look, and I'm, I'm sure you're both happy. We had an hour and a half, but I, I also predict that having this race right on top of us when we start is, is at least something that you guys have to work a little bit harder to try to work with and work around. Yeah. So uh, for me, for me, I, um, for me, I like it because it gets the show started. You have the open, you have Lafitte and Tom on set. They say, hello. They introduce who Tiz Law is the sto big story coming up later. Oh, but we have a race coming up here in two or three minutes. And then I like, you kind of get like, uh, you kind of get like excited right when the show starts. At least I do. And I tell the feet this, I still get a little bit of anxiety going into a live broadcast. Having this race right off the top allowed me to just calm down for a minute. It's like, all right, we go, we do the open, we say hello. Now take a deep breath and relax. So I, I don't know if that was the same a live race. This is muscle memory, you know? Yeah. Like, like a quarterback I will tell, say, you know, I don't feel like the game has started till I get hit for the first time. <laughs> You know, right. it's a lot like that in that everybody kind of takes a deep breath and falls into rhythm once you get to live race mode. So I never mind having a race uh, right off, uh, right off the top and um, in, and explaining, remembering that this is a Fox audience when you in this particular race pointing out that Chad Brown has the favorite. It's not just Chad Brown. It's trainer Chad Brown. Or, or his relationship with Peter Brandt, owner Peter Brandt. And you have to explain that to a certain extent where you explain who Wea was. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a marathon for, for, the, for the Phillies and Marathon. All of that needs to be 
really emphasize for somebody otherwise who's going to feel like they're cracking open a racing form for the first time, be intimidated by the jargon, not understanding what they're watching. And in the first five minutes, you've lost your audience. And I like that this is also an opportunity that, you know, we can't hear it completely right now, but it's not that important. This is another opportunity for you to point out Manny Franco, who is the right. essentially the human star that we're going to be talking about for the next hour and 20 minutes. That was a great call by Terrence. Terrence uh, knew you know, this horse didn't have much of a shot. Normally we're talking about favorites leading up to the gate, but no, there's Manny. This is his last mount before the Travers. He won't ride in the, uh, in the test. So giving him some, introducing one of the stars of the show as close as you can to the top, I thought was a, was a really good call. Yeah. And then uh, one of my favorite parts of this show is uh, we're going to see it here. I want a couple more horses load, but it was the wind star cam that we had Um and I wish we had it every day. I wish we had it for the 10 claimers on, on Wednesdays, but <laughs> it's a uh, T were you excited to have this and tell me how it was different for you and the truck having this view to work with. Oh man. I mean, it's a producer's dream. Like look at this shot, right? Like when you have this for not only live coverage, but also for replays uh, and you'll see later in the show, little bump shots or bump shots are like the, the shots of the town that you see coming in or out of break. I mean, it enhances the production value a ton. And that's, you know, that it's not work by me. That's, that's the airplane and the pilot and the, and the camera guy with the pilot. Um, and yeah, you're right. This gave us three opportunities throughout the show to show off that wind star, uh, aerial camp. And I'm with you, man. I wish we had it every show, uh, or at least every Saturday, but as you can imagine, it's not cheap. You know how you watch maybe a football game, your seats are in the end zone and there's a running play, you can see the holes opening and closing. Or, for example, when NBC is toyed with the with a, the Madden view on a Sunday night game, there was a heavy fog game. It might have been in New England a couple of years back, and they almost did the entire game with that Madden view, that end zone look, the holes opening and closing. The aerial shot and the Windstar Farm Cam we had this year on, for whatever reasons, on grass races specifically, or we also saw it with uh, – with, um, when we look back at, at, at the acorn with Gamine, for some reason, overhead, the acceleration is so much more pronounced overhead. Even in this race with the eventual winner, when she goes on by, we look back at, from the from that bird's eye view and it's much more pronounced. And, and for the viewer, wow, look at that. That horse is really turning it on. And I think just um, it really adds a lot to the describing what just took place in that race. Yeah. Especially, you know, for, for racing fans at Saratoga, I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't, there's my favorite place in the world. I love it more than anything and every aspect of it, but it, the angle, because the grandstand's not very tall is tough to tell who's winning at the eighth pole when you're looking at it on the pan, because you just can't see them moving, but you can absolutely see it here. Like you said, sis, uh, my sister Nat, you saw her kick away. It was obviously even more impressive with Gamine and with, with Tis the Law when they kicked away. But it is such a great uh, perspective. And I think it works really well for, for the, the mainstream audience to be able to understand what they're saying. And w when I watch an NBC or back in the day when ESPN was doing Breeders' Cup, it, when I watch those and they have these aerial cams, I I love it as a viewer at home, not not just as uh, as, as part of our – arsenal when we're doing a show but as a viewer at home i just love um e even if i don't have money on the race i i'm trying to think back uh was it street sense the kentucky derby nbc had that aerial cam and perfect example or i'm sorry yeah street sense or mind that bird or really honestly both oh. both oh. of them I, I just remember uh my parents who aren't big horse racing fans they don't know anything about horse racing and i remember watching that with my dad and he was like man that camera angle was really cool and that's what you're trying to do you're trying to connect to that viewer in any way that you can what, what do you guys think about the uh like the infield kind of truck cam that you see like in dubai and stuff do you, i like that one too i'm not I, I don't have a problem with that one at all that's more of a question for you. jonathan you're the horse player among us yeah. um the artsier the more i'm gonna like it i love that angle that you just referenced um the way that racing is often cut uh, on a on a national level by either NBC or what we did with Fox during the Travers, the overhead. You have to. What is it that the horse players? Because it seems to me, I always find the biggest complaint from horse players about national coverage of horse racing on big days are the camera angles. What's the complaint? Well, I, I think that we're just we're we're conditioned as horse players to be able to identify what's happening in a race when when you're stressed out, the money's on the line. Um, I mean, I'm not that way. I prefer to see the different angles. I love it when we're on the backside of a turf race 
and you in T you flip to that head on, or the director flips to that if Mitch is if he's not sleeping when and you. <laughs> And, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I absolutely love Mitch, but uh, he can't even probably use YouTube, so he won't be able to watch this. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, I'm that's kidding again. I love Mitch more than anything. Whenever I laugh on TV, it's because Mitch is saying something in my ear. Um, that when you go to the head on on the backside in the turf races, I love it more than anything because I know when my horses are in a good spot, you can tell who's throwing their head in rank. I mean, I love it. it doesn't bother me at all. Here's that angle we were talking okay. about. Mm-hmm. Watch my sister Nat. You don't pick this up on the pan when she really finds her best drive. From here, you can really see it, and especially in turf racing where it's all about acceleration. It's so much more pronounced. Love it. Mm -hmm. And so just to tell everyone who might not know, this was an airplane, right, that was circling around. And and I'm I'm assuming there's a pilot and a camera operator? Yes. And he was on all day. So you could always cut to this. He was always giving you something? Yeah, we used him on the undercard. Um, We recorded uh, a couple of – you know, scenic shots to use throughout the day. And uh, I, you know, I'm not a part of the business dealings, but apparently we hired him for the whole day and he was up there flying around and a camera operator was up there with the remote controls and we had contact to them through the truck and they gave us all the shots we needed. That's so this a, this is a walkover well. shot real quick T just let me, uh, can you pause this real quick, Craig? Um, go ahead T uh, go ahead. Uh, Lafitte. I'll come back to that, to that walkover you shot. Know, that was the, that was the point. It's something that Terrence, um, has uh, included especially for stakes races it's a cool moment when almost like a you know a, a prize fighter getting ready to enter the ring you've just watched a live race but but you know look look who's you know look who's on our way over and having that shot and viewers have gotten a lot of good feedback they really love seeing this because it reminds you of what's coming up next kind of gets the blood pumping for the bigger race the stakes races that are coming they're seeing Gamin coming over before the test. I this is an, an element I, I can't get enough of. Do you do you assign that to someone T to, to in the in the truck to 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 spot her, find her, and have that ready for you? Because uh, I don't want to back up, but you know we were just getting done. Hand, you know you're handling the the wrap up of the the, the way up. so mm-hmm. you're obviously busy. You know talking to Lafitte in his ear. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Who handles finding this shot? Uh, so. We do pick it out beforehand. Usually, um, you know, the night before when we're putting the rundown together, we'll put in there like we want a shot of the five horse for that next race coming up. Uh, a woman we work with named Jody Petrovsky, you guys obviously are familiar with. Um, she will then coordinate with the camera operator from that specific camera to shoot that horse. And then also our Elvis operator, our EVS, uh, it's, a, it's a fancy recording machine in the truck that she will then tell the Elvis operator, that's the horse we need. Make sure that if we don't get to it exactly live, make sure you record it so we can play it heading to break basically as a video element going to break as Lafitte said saying, yeah, we just watched so-and-so win that race, but here comes a superstar, uh, you know, in Gamin walking over. How many cameras uh, do we have on a Wednesday at Saratoga? How many cameras did we have for Travers Day? I think we have, uh, if you count the live view cameras, which are the cameras with the reporters, I think we probably have somewhere between 12, 12 and 15 on an average day. And that's all the different angles. That's the, the turf cameras. Uh, that's the, the robotic cameras that are in the, in the paddock and uh, ways horses walk out onto the track that we can use sometimes for post braids, all those cameras combined. We have about, I'd say 12 to 15. Uh, I want to say for Traverse day, we had probably a double or more. So probably 25 to 30. Um, yeah, there's quite a few out there, including like the jib operator. Uh, well, we didn't have a jib this year. We did last year. Um, with the jibs, the, that's a, the, the kind of like thing that looks like it doesn't move. No, that's the steady cam. The jib okay. is like a big crane that has the camera on it that can move and get you cool. It's used more for cool shots of the crowd, which is why we used it last year. And we didn't, you know, spend the money on it this year. Any technical questions should be directed at me, JK. <laughs> <laughs> Explain this better to the viewer who's trying to understand television a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to commercial here. I get, I'm assuming this is your first deep breath, T. Yeah. Well, essentially the second, because that first race, you know, like I said, gives you a chance to kind of catch your breath. And then this, you know, it's funny because commercial breaks aren't for the producer and for the director probably aren't actually 
breaths. I mean, you're looking at that rundown. You always have to stay at least one, probably two or three steps ahead throughout the whole show. So during this commercial break, I'm looking at the next segment, making sure everything's queued up, making sure everything's ready to go. If we're tight on time, I need to maybe kill something. I'm trying to figure out what will get cut from the show if we're over. Um, if we're light on time, I'm trying to figure out how we can fill that time, uh, which doesn't happen in a show like this. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's when you're in a commercial break, you're looking ahead at that next segment. So it really, it's kind of funny. My downtime is actually during the race. I'm watching it to pick out the key points in the race and what we want to highlight in replays along with the uh, analysis from, you know, Tom Amos, Gary Stevens, Andy, who give their input on what they want to see on a replay. Um, but that's the slowest moment in the show for me is actually when a race is actually going on. It's funny. Sometimes you go back and you see things that you wish you would have done better. Um, and that was a perfect example. We had not seen Chad Brown in the show yet. We hadn't seen Peter Brandt and, and not high, not mentioning who that was when we saw them in the winner's circle. I'd like to, I would have liked to have had that back. So I think that's important. So, uh, so obviously you would have liked to express uh, who Peter Brandt was and his significance in, in real, the real world, because that's, it's a good story to tell, especially when you're watching this. Um, I, I think the thing about TV that I was the most shocked about and, and I haven't even experienced it close to the level that you have, Lafitte. But this, while you're talking right now, Terrence is in your ear. Not, not every second, but he's in your ear telling you what's coming up next, you know, letting you know, blah, 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 blah. T talk a little bit about that dynamic, how you've gotten used to it. And, and, and then, T, talk a little bit about how you've kind of identified which talent you need to stay out of their ear for and who you can, you can really talk to like you're having a conversation. You want, to, you want to start? Yeah, go ahead, Lafitte. So, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, that's a one of the biggest challenges when you're first starting is learning how to still be, you know, focus on what you're discussing and picking up on the key words of what's being said to you um, in terms of instruction and whatever information the producer is, is relaying. What Terrence does a really good job of is, generally speaking, if I'm singled up at the very top, he's not going to talk to me then because he knows that can be incredibly, incredibly distracting. Um, but when we are live and I am, I am speaking in that moment, he does a really good job of concisely giving me enough information so that he knows how to pick out what's important. Um, it, it can be, it can be distracting when someone's going on speaking, giving you too much information. So I'm not going to be able to absorb everything right then. Again, I'm only listening to some of what you're saying. So I'm still trying to concentrate on the show. And what he has figured out really well, at least for myself, is when to provide that information and, and to do it concisely. Telling me what I really need to hear. Yeah, and I uh, that's that's intentional. I mean, I I try to only talk to you guys when you're not talking. There are times where that's unavoidable, especially for the host, because the host needs the most information throughout the course of the show. Uh, but for instance, you know, when Lafitte right there uh, starts talking, if I need to tell Tom something, I would wait until that moment to tell Tom. I'd try to, if you can. Uh, and I don't know how you guys do it. I I <laughs> I don't know how you guys. I don't know how you guys continue talking when somebody's talking in your ear. I know that I'm the one in the ear. I just don't get it because I could not do that. I love watching TV now and identifying when someone's being talked to in their ear. You just kind of like. And, you just, and it's, you, but it's interesting, Jonathan, you had mentioned like different talent or on-air personalities. Do you guys like different amounts of traffic in your ear? So I've worked with some people where they're like, don't talk to me when I'm doing this or this or, you know. And then other people are like, no, more information, the better. Keep talking to me. I don't care if I'm talking. And it's so you kind of learn like, um, uh, you know, there's certain people that I can talk to them all day long while they're talking and it, they won't miss a beat. And then there are certain people where I know, OK, wait until they throw to a different uh, different analyst or wait till they throw to a, a story or a commercial break or whatever and then talk to them. Uh, but everybody's a little bit different and uh, has different preferences in that way. So this is a good opportunity for us to highlight uh, our colleague and and uh, the ABR award winner for analyst Maggie Wolfendale. You know what's funny is when 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 I saw this for the first time and we paused at a, at a spot where you can't see it, but you'll see it when we run it. In the background, the horse in the background is the five horse that's circling. So I thought that it was we recorded this live. I thought it was Gamine because Gamine was the five in this race. But I we recorded this right. Yeah, this is this was pre-recorded. 
Were all of the hits re- pre-recorded? Hers, Acacia's, and Greg's? Yep, everyone's was pre-recorded, and Gary's as well. Everyone Gary's here. Just this particular whip. Oh, yeah, just, yeah, just, just like this, this two-minute segment. Yeah. So now, now, next year, and this is something, see, Jonathan just picked up on something I didn't, and I guess, Terrence, that's a question for you next year, or, or we could do that, that we would pan to the right a little bit. You probably yep. don't want that screen right behind Matt. So it, might, yeah. It, it's funny, because... Yeah, I didn't even pick up on that. And uh, I, I, I'm glad it was the five horse in the background. That's a nice you know, coincidence. But uh, you'll see Acacia's hit momentarily. And Acacia actually was facing the other direction when she initially recorded it. And she did her first take and it was perfect. And I was like, wait a minute, we got to do that again. And everybody was like, why? You know, it was perfect. The long jeans clock was over her shoulder and it was two hours before airtime. So I forget what time this show started. Let's say it started at five o'clock. It'd be five fifteen, and the clock over her shoulder would have said three thirty. And I'm like, we can't do a pre-recorded hit with a giant Longines clock right over her shoulder, telling the viewer that this isn't live. So we had to turn around and face the other direction and do it. All right, so we're gonna watch this whip because it's actually a pretty cool one. So we'll uh, we'll let it run. It's a longer distance than any horse in this race has ever run before. Especially See, good means in the background. <laughs> an extra eighth of a mile from the Belmont Stakes. Now, the Kentucky Derby, it is run at a mile and a quarter. So if Tis the Law is successful with this longer distance, it should set him up well for a run for the Roses the first Saturday in September. But for more on the connections of your Travers favorite, we'll check in with Hall of Fame and two-time Travers winning jockey Gary Stevens. Tis the Law made his first start of the year in the Holy Bowl Stakes. Manny Franco was given specific instruction from Barkley Tag to get him to the outside and in the clear. However, turning into the backside, Manny found himself in a pocket he didn't want to be in. Did something you can't do with most horses. He drug him back, took him to the outside, regained his position, stalked the leaders into the stretch, and marched on to an impressive victory. Since then, he won the Florida Derby, the Belmont Stakes, and he hasn't looked back. Greg? Behind me is the barn of Barkley Tag, 82 years young. His partnership with Tiny Sacatoga Stable has been one of this sport's most improbable success stories. A small group of friends with an even smaller budget. They landed the horse of a lifetime when Funny Side took the first two legs of the Triple Crown back in 2003. It has defied all logic and probability to be in this position again. Yet here they are, 17 years later, in the midst of another Triple Crown, which is the law. We'll hear from the man behind Sacatoga, Jack Knowlton on lightning striking twice a little later in the show. Now let's check in with Acacia Courtney. And Greg, while there are no spectators today at Saratoga Racecourse, the Tis the Law mania is still very much alive. We see shops downtown with signs promoting this very special New York bread, selling baseball caps and T-shirts for Tis the Law. There are also masks on sale like this one to benefit the racetrack chaplaincy and the backstretch community. He is Lafitte, the hometown hero. So much pride, Acacia. Great story for Tis the Law, who's already earned 272 Kentucky Derby points, 170 Derby points available today. It's hard to tell how many it'll take to qualify just uncharted territory. Meantime, why not get started on building that Derby bankroll now? Here's how. Bet $50 to win on one horse on any or all of the selected bankroll builder races and earn a $20 bonus per race. Your ticket doesn't even have to hit. Today, the bankroll builder is the Run Happy Travers. Visit NairaBets.com for details. Oh, I guess I should have unmuted. Yeah. A of guys. I know. <laughs> I guess I should have muted. Uh, unmuted. Andy Serling. What I was saying is, is when we were when the canoe was up, I'm, I'm assuming that Terrence was telling Lafitte in his ear, you got the Naira Betts read coming up. Yeah. But one thing he hasn't had to do yeah. And, and he, um, yeah. we have, he knows that I'm pretty, He'll always give me maybe a reminder, but you know, I, I should know that going in regardless. But as a reminder, he'll always kind of give me a heads up. Um, the reporters did a really good job there in giving the viewer, um, a Fox audience, a reason to care. Um, Maggie very subtly simplifying some of the differences in terms of this year's Travers, and everybody knows what the whenever you can compare something to the Kentucky Derby, if nothing else, you can bank that somebody watching who doesn't follow horse racing knows gets the gist of a Kentucky Derby. Um, so I thought that was well done. Um, and, and now you have a reason to really care and understand about not just the horse, but the people surrounding Tis the Law, Sacatoga, uh, Barkley Tag, and the town itself. 
um, with Acacia pointing out, you know, with the signs and everything, what this day normally would have been like with all the people at Saratoga, New York's horse, the heavy favorite in the Travers. Um, but highlighting again, giving the viewer a reason to really care about this horse and the people surrounding him. Now, before we get to the most important part of the show, which obviously you can see here, um, you guys were having IFB issues. IFB obviously is the little device that goes in your ear where Terrence can talk to, to Lafitte. When, when were those problems happening, happening and when did they, did they stop? When did they stop? It, it was, uh, it was basically the last 20 minutes of the show. So that, uh, pretty much the most inconvenient time for it to happen. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly the point it started. I think it was, like I said, the last 20 minutes. So probably would have been right around post parade for the Travers. And then all the way through to the end of the show, I don't think Lafitte heard my voice those final 20 minutes. Tony, Al yeah, Tony Alavado, who runs the ship, started talking to me and giving me directions. What the hell is Tony talking to me for? And there were a couple of points where in the rundown, we were supposed to go either back to you guys or I'm supposed to throw to a reporter, but I'm not gonna throw it blindly either. Like on a I'm not gonna throw to somebody without being told to. If I haven't been told, maybe there's a reason. And you can tell there's a couple of areas where I'm stretching, 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 waiting. Am I supposed to go? Okay, I guess not. I'll just keep the ball. And during that time, Terrence was trying to talk to me. And in the truck, it took them a while to figure out, like, dude, he can't hear you. Like, he clearly yeah. cannot hear you. So, yeah, the, only the most important part of the show. And what's worse about losing communication is not knowing you've lost communication. So I, I didn't know for So the first couple of times I tried to talk to Lafitte, I, I thought he was – ignoring me or blowing through a stop sign or whatever, you know? And I'm like, man, what, like Lafitte doesn't do that. Just to be clear. Like it was very abnormal. And I'm like, what the hell is he doing? And then <laughs> I started to realize that Tom sitting next to him could hear me, Andy and Jonathan on the other set, they could hear me. Everybody could hear me except Lafitte. And I'm like, this is, this is not a good situation. So in the truck we had um just to give people perspective i was sitting in the front row and right behind me was uh pete the fox producer and then right behind him was tony alvado well pete doesn't have communication panel so whenever that last 20 minutes whenever i needed to get information to lafitte it was like a game of telephone in the truck i would turn around and tell pete pete would turn around and tell tony and then tony would tell lafitte in his ear so it was kind of a, a delayed communication system Which i don't think we had that problem for any of the any other show this summer. Never. Never. It, it happened one time for the most inconvenient 20 minutes of the Travers show and only to Lafitte, the host of the show. Like I, I would have been fine if, you know, my communication went out to Jonathan or Tom or even Andy. Like we can we can work around that. My communication to Lafitte went out for 20 Did minutes. Did we ever get to the bottom of it? Did we ever figure that out? Uh, no, the truck leaves it that night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. yeah. Here, this is only your, this is your second... Fox show, Jonathan. Were you were you nervous? Oh, dude. I mean, the first one, like last year. <laughs> you told me last year you were you were schwitzing pretty good. Well, I mean, so <laughs> last year I used to get really nervous as a whole. You know, that one day when I was by myself at Oaklawn and I just like I was trying to scroll through my iPad and Telepic <laughs> Five. I, that was like the worst. That was like the we we had so much fun watching that. Because the problem <laughs> the the problem is is the week before I was there with Lafitte, so. Like, you know, being the professional he is, he like prepped me on the question he was going to ask. And it was just like comfortable and I felt good. And I felt like, okay, I've arrived. I've got this. And then I came back the next week by myself and I just freaking struggled. I was sweating. And so by the time I had gotten to this part of the show in Saratoga, you know, I, I, it was, but I, you know, it, it's the big show. And so I was nervous this year. I wasn't as nervous um, because I had a longer lead until when I, until when I started, you know? And that that helped. The last show I was on a lot sooner in the, in the show, so um, yeah, I was nervous. I'm probably sweating. Andy's staring at me here. Let's 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 hear. It. Let's <laughs> he's, just he's just like he's judging. <laughs> yeah, let's hear what Andy. Let's hear what Andy has to say. Every word coming out of your mouth. Look at that. <laughs> when you're sitting next to Andy, you're always ready to say something stupid. He's gonna jump on you. He's not. He's well behaved during these shows. Talented, talented horse. Bob Baffert's won this race three. I like times, these traffic. Five Kentucky Derbies, two Triple Crowns. I think he knows what a three-year-old dirt classic horse looks like, and I think Uncle Chuck might be one. He's fast. He's got a huge stride, and I think that he'll – So much easier sitting next to someone else not being by yourself. Such a huge difference. Trainer that 
Brown's laws and that the this trainer Chad Brown of, brings country grammar into this race. Now, Chad Brown has won three straight titles or three titles at the Saratoga race meet, and he's really not the leading trainer this year, but he's still considered. Yeah, and you're right. We kind of introduced Chad Brown here, but he had already won that previous race. Yeah. Yeah. Considers the race he wants. Andy does a really good job of quickly introducing who he is, why he's so significant, and how important this race is for him to win. Belmont Stakes this year, a prep for the Travers on opening day at Saratoga. Country Grammar is an improving horse for trainer Chad Brown, but is he good enough to take on the likes? And this goes back to that every horse has a story. We're just trying to tell a little bit of a story for each horse. So this is when I realized that Gamine wasn't in the picture earlier because she doesn't have her saddle. <laughs> she won that day by 18 and three quarter devastating lengths she is the one tonight and going back real quick to what you and um, you and andy just talked about so it was the bob baffert uncle chuck it was the chad brown country grammar one of the things when lafitte and i met uh, a week to 10 days before this show one of the things we talked about is a storyline and it's not fabricated but it might be kind of embellished a little bit it's just you're playing okay tisla is that hometown hero for barkley tag the 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 saratoga favorite right um Chad Brown and Uncle Ch uh, Chad Brown and Bob Baffert are essentially in this show that we're watching. They're essentially the villains coming in to spoil the party for Tis the Law, and you're trying to build that up as here is Tis the Law, who is th not only the favorite, the betting favorite in the race, but he's the fan favorite. Bob Baffert and Chad Brown, these guys that dominate each coast of racing, are here to spoil Barkley Tag and Sacatoga Stables party, and that's kind of that story we were trying to tell right there in that brief little hit. I, lo I loved this, obviously, where you guys went, uh, Lafitte, where they, they went to uh, the Adelphi, they went to Salevo, um, and they went over to, to, uh, to Prime, um, two of those places we went to more than once this summer. Uh, <laughs> I, I tried to do cart talk. I just want everyone to know I tried to do cart talk at, at Salevo this summer, and it got shut down just because wow. driving the cart over there was going to be a problem. I will do it next year. That I will get G. I'll get G and we'll do cart talk at, at Salevo next year for sure. You're very popular at Salevo, and I don't know how it is that you can always get a table. I'm like, <laughs> like, yeah, it's 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 it gets a little irritating after a while. Nobody else <laughs> except Jonathan Kinchin. Call Jonathan; he can get a table. It's a Salevo hat. It's got to do something. It's, you know. Oh yeah. It was a cool hit to show again everybody because that you don't get to see the fans at the racetrack, but you can see how they're enjoying, still enjoying the event. You know, and and, and getting together, masked up. Um, yeah, I thought this was a really good element in the show. Look, I know we're I know we're we're, we're you know whatever four months five months away or, you know or five months past it, but I mean the town was still buzzing. You know, I think that's the important part to realize. And I think it was buzzing in a, in a, you know, as someone who's come back to Texas, buzzing in a safe way, you know, a way that I felt comfortable with the way it was buzzing. Um, and so this is, like you said, is a good illustration of that. I yeah, agree. There, there's something about Saratoga. I mean, this is my third Saratoga. I'm, you know, born and raised in Cincinnati, so not far from Louisville and Lexington. Uh, I worked at HRTV for years in Los Angeles at Santa Anita. All these towns have great, rich, uh, rich history in horse racing. There's something about Saratoga that it's just, I tell people it's like a college town, but instead of being centered around a university, it's centered around horse racing for two months. And it's just like a two month party for horse racing. It was obviously different this year, much, you know, the, not as crowded, the re a lot of some of the restaurants weren't open or it was only outdoor seating or whatever, but that enthusiasm and that, that excitement for horse racing being part of that town was absolutely still there. Whatever it's like in South Bend on a Friday, Saturday, leading up to a Notre Dame game. That's, that's what, mm -hmm. or maybe somebody who hasn't been, that's, that's what Saratoga Springs feels like for seven weeks or whatever it is, close to two months every summer about, about their racing. Yeah. Here in the paddock, mean. Well, she looks much the same as what she did going into that acorn performance, which was utterly. And I think another thing that for a lot of you guys are on air that needs to be said is uh, again, this is just an hour and a half show, but we were on air that day for seven hours, something like that. Yep. I think we started at 11 30 that day. I mean, we're covering the racing all day long. I mean, you guys didn't really get much of a break. Like, that and, can't and be easy. You know, anytime you have like a show of that magnitude, um, when you're on, when you're on the, the bigger network, um, there is a lot of, of of rehearsal that goes into it. I still, it's it's my we 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 got very little rehearsal time. Where last year we had a good, you know, 
couple of hours of running through elements, just familiarity, just to see it on the screen and conversation topics that are coming going to come up between you and the, and the analyst. You know, Tom Amos won the ballerina earlier <laughs> that day with Serengeti Emperors. You know, it's not like so. This this was this one was this one was a challenge just because you didn't have a chance to to get those reps in in in, in rehearse a little bit. Uh, beforehand, it was a, you, know, <laughs> you know what's funny about about this show? I, you, you talk about being nervous. Um, the race before I went on to go to the set, before I, you know, before I went over the set, I went and watched Serengeti Empress run. And 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 people that listen to the show know that I had that wager with Craig Burnick that she would never win on the Grade One. So, I I mean, I got snapped for eight thousand dollars before I went on the show. <laughs> I'm sweating. I'm like, oh, come on, come on. I can't believe she got beat. Then I had to go congratulate Tom and tell him I was happy for him. Um, but I, I mean, obviously I was. But um, I think we lucked out a little bit, um, T. Lafitte, by having this superstar to talk about leading up to that race, right? I, I think it was a it was a fun story to be able to cover. She, you know, she was she was brilliant before this race. She was obviously brilliant in this race, and she's continued to be brilliant. Um, I mean, it's a huge advantage to having some like you know race where no one cares about anything. You got Baffert here. Were you excited to know this race was going to be in the show, T? Yeah, and it, you know, you say we lucked out. It, it's not entirely luck. You know, Tony Alavato, you guys mentioned earlier, and our racing department get together and they decide which races they want to put in the show. Um, and after you know exhaustive discussion, they decided Gamine had to be in the show. Like she had to be part of the show. And I think maybe for some of the multi-race exotics, they maybe would have preferred not to have her in the show. Uh, but they decided that as a storyline, as uh, as part of the entertainment value for our fans, that she had to be in the show. This handicapping segment, uh, you and Andy had some fun. I think he called you a chalk eating weasel or vice versa. Or whatever. <laughs> he did. Yeah, he did. He said, uh, I, that's usually your job. Um, but but he, he left it to me. And then, you know, I, I think that one of the things I want to talk about um, quickly, Craig, if you can just kind of pause just for a second. You know, when it comes to these, uh, Terrence, you're always extremely, extremely accommodating when it comes to asking us for wagers. You always left me up, let me off the hook if I don't want to give a wager because the biggest issue that we have a lot of times in these shows is me being able to give a, an intelligent wager out that's digestible to the fans and to, to the newer fans. Like Lafitte mentioned earlier, you know, you've got people that are sitting on their couch watching this show on Fox that just turn their TV on and it just happens to still be on from the news they were watching earlier or whatever it might be. And, and so you know, I don't, I can't give them a try wheel where you back wheel. That's the, I can't do all that. You, you have to keep it simple. And, and, uh, and so, th th you know, I, I just wanted to, 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 to say that I, I'm very thankful that, um, the, this show and the producers on this show don't ever force us to do things like that. We don't feel great about. Yeah. I mean, I, I've say not just for the handicappers, for anybody, I, I don't like putting words in any of your mouths. You guys are the professionals. You know what you're talking about. My job is to organize, communicate, and try to make it look pretty. Your job and Lafitte's job and Tom Amos's job and Gary and Maggie, your jobs are to give your opinions and your knowledge out to the viewer. I'm not going to put words in your mouth. I'm nine times out of 10. I'm not going to make you talk about a horse you don't want to talk about. We'll ask, who do you want to focus on? Whether it's a pick or just a, an interesting angle or a horse to throw out or whatever those are your opinions that you're trying to give to the viewer. And as you mentioned, just, we do try to keep it simple on a daily basis, but especially in this show, um, you know, when we give out those pick five or pick six tickets that you give out, we're not, you know, we're not trying to spend, you know, $700 on a pick five ticket, you know, like you, you know, some viewers might be doing, but that's not our audience. And the only reason I brought that up with you and Andy, they kind of barbing each other a little bit, Jonathan, because it was remind it's okay to have fun. Yeah, of course. And okay. I, you know, and that's the thing about Andy. Sorry, Lafitte. That, that's the thing about Andy that you know. I, I was. I, I hope to try to get across when I had him on my on my podcast earlier. Is that you know, I think Andy, Andy the the history in this game that he's been around for that he knows that he loves he cherishes. There's a side of Andy that I think that we've seen more than some people might see that is warm and endearing and fun and exciting and. You know, and that's it when he made that little joke, but he wasn't trying to be hurtful. He was just poking, being funny. It just works out. It's good. You know, it's it's good TV. So sometimes you can get so focused and locked in to the show itself. Something like that happens during the course of a show. I mean, you know, it's, it's okay to have fun. It's okay 
to mess around a little bit. And everybody at the same time will kind of just kind of take a deep breath. And yeah, yeah, for sure. I will say this. I wanted to pause here and, and he can, you can go ahead and run it, Craig. Now, this is the greatest shot we have at Saratoga. I love this <laughs> shot more than anything. Yeah. And, it, you know, next year it'll be better when hopefully those masks are no longer there. I don't know what the situation will be, but you see the jockey's face, the anticipation, anticipation, the focus. It's, it's kind of like that a little less, uh, a little less rock concerty, but it's kind of like that shot in the Super Bowl when the players are running out on the field and, you know, you're getting ready for that big battle. And it's, it's the, the intensity and the focus on the jockey's face is really cool. Horses coming out on the track to me, you think New York, Belmont, you're about to hear New York, New York, Belmont Day, whether it's the Triple Crown on the line or not, 60,000 or 90,000 singing New York, New York, San Anita, the San Gabriel Mountains, and here at Saratoga, horses coming out on the track and the people lined, you know, eight, nine, ten deep during a normal year seeing the superstars of our sport up close and personal. Oh, by the way, I screw, I screw Amos right here. I totally screw Amos right here, who did a great job on the show. I love his comparison <laughs> to Diane Williamson and his comparison to Joe Burrow at Tizzle Law at the top of the show. I'm like, oh, Tom, here, post parade for the uh, for the test. Here's up in smoke. When you guys were supposed to handle the post parade, I completely, completely laid out Amos here. Tom, if you're looking, I apologize, my friend. It's so funny, too, because Andy, so when we do these post parades, uh, the, the analysts, we, um, we get odds or evens. So for the day, it's just like, you know, Andy will be like, you got odds, you got odds. In this show, I was supposed to have evens, but the one horse up in smoke, Andy knew that that was one of my best friends, Jake Ballas's horse. He said, let's switch for this one so you can talk about up in smoke, which was very nice of Andy to do. Well, I didn't get to talk about it. <laughs> I handed it off to the right person. And then you <laughs> in her paddock report talking about Gamine and the equipment did a great job of explaining what exactly it was for somebody who isn't a horse racing fan about she had an issue either with keeping her head cocked or not necessarily running straight. And I thought that really it, it illustrated very clearly what the equipment was for, what it looked like and why it was necessary. T, we have a different camera uh, here for the post parade, but we've talked about this, you and I independently, because I had told you that I'd seen on some some Internet chatter of horse players not liking the, the way we were doing the post parades where it's almost this angle here where you're seeing more of the pony than the horse. I wanted you to get a chance to just kind of explain why it is that way. And, 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 you know, it kind of goes back to some of those limitations we have. Yeah. It, that actually frustrates me too. Not just, you know, I don't think it's just the horse players because for the post parade, you want to see the horse that's running in the race. And, uh, I think at Naira, we did make the adjustment toward the end of the meet of starting to use that inside camera more so you can see the, the horse walking in that direction. Um, it's tough, though, because that shot is quicker. So Lafitte or Greg, who are setting up the horse for you, Tom or Andy, that time that you have to talk about each given horse is condensed even more. And it just makes it trickier to use that camera on a regular basis, unless it's just Lafitte doing the post parader. You know, there are ways around it, but the way we typically did them with the, uh, the, we call them the pan cameras up on the top that shoot down with those cameras, we're able to keep on the horse longer. So when we switch to that inside camera, yeah, it looks nicer, but it's quicker and you go and you go and you go. For this Travers show, as you mentioned, that's the steady cam you were mentioning that the guy holds and uh, it's called a steady cam because it doesn't really move and it, uh, you know, the horses kind of walk through and it's a very majestic shot. That's an expensive shot, is it? Is it an <laughs> expensive shot? I mean, why can't we do that on Wednesday for 10 claimers, T? Yeah, it's expensive. <laughs> you, you call Windstar, maybe see if they'll sponsor that too. I don't know. But yeah. <laughs> It's not as expensive as the airplane, but it's, uh, it's not cheap. Just call Salevo, Jonathan. <laughs> and the Salevo cam. Salevo, you got the Salevo cam. They'll, they'll handle it. If it comes from you, they'll it'll be taken care of. Or Jonathan, take... if you're, when you're not on set, you can be the steady cam operator. That'll cut the cost <laughs> in half. <laughs> you only got to pay half. <laughs> exactly. I can try. I can try. Um, this is obviously a great opportunity for us to shout out Mac for all the support for uh, that he he put up uh, with the run happy stuff for the show. Um, I think it's probably safe to say that these last couple of years we wouldn't have uh, been able to have the show if it wasn't for the support of of, of Mattress Mac and and uh, Run Happy. So it's a nice little piece showing some of his philanthropy in Houston, and then also uh, the the donut philanthropy philanthropy in uh, in Saratoga. You know, I've tried to explain that, guys, to when I've been asked you know, that they, you know, we have to say run happy so often on the show or they run happy sponsors this, or they run happy a sponsor that and trying to convey and make it very clear to the viewer. Like, yeah, do you, do you understand that the coverage that you're getting a chance to see might not be available if not for mattress Mac, 
if not for the sponsorship of Run Happy and, and the money that he has poured in uh, to, to, to supporting uh, our coverage over the last uh, couple of years. Um, the, the viewer that that takes, you know, it's easy whenever you, because you hear it so often, there's nothing in television that can't be, you know, you, you, you there can be a little bit of overkill, like I get it. But the flip side of that was, and we, would you rather not have the coverage? Would you rather not have an opportunity to see these races or the exposure on a platform like Fox? Uh, so I think that very often that's a conversation. That's something that I've, I've, I've discussed with those. Why do I have to constantly hear this run happy? Um, his support um, over the last few years, our coverage, it, he was a, a big, uh, has been a big part of it. And, and we may not be able to provide the product that we have the last few years uh, without it. Um. This is also fun too. I want to talk about Maggie on 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 horseback. How how much how different is that for you, T? Um, trying to coordinate that. I love it. I it, it's one of my favorite things of our show is when Maggie's out there on horseback and she's giving analysis of how the horses look when they're loading into the gate. But even more so, those immediate post race interviews with the winning jockey. I this is one of my favorite things of these big weekend shows that we do. Um, it's actually not that hard. And, uh, from my perspective, uh, where's that camera T where's that camera? Uh, we use those tower cams or the pan cam. So we're using our ordinary everyday cameras. We use to shoot the race. They just take a, you know, 15 second break from shooting the horses and pan over and shoot mm -hmm. Maggie. Right. Yeah. And we tell Maggie, Hey, uh, you, the camera two is shooting you right now. And she knows where all the cameras are. So she'll give a quick glance at the camera and kind of say hello to the viewer before she turns her attention to the horses. Um, and you know, Jaeger, the horse she's on is, uh, become kind of a, uh, superstar on our show, I think because of how often we use them. And, uh, I just want to say, I think it was, was it last year, last year when Maggie was pregnant and I was like, all right, well, so we're not going to use Maggie on the horse. And she's like, no, I'm still doing it. And I'm like, what you can't be on a horse. You're pregnant. And she kept saying, no, it's no problem. She's like, I'm galloping horses in the morning. What's the difference? And I'm like, look, I'm not going to be the producer that says you're getting on a horse while you're pregnant. So what I'm going to do is let you come and tell me each show that you're going to be on the horse. So I was like, you're going to make that call. I'm not being that guy. I'm not going to have, I'm not going to have Tom Morley coming after me. She's a gamer. <laughs> we, we had last year, uh, not this summer, 19, uh, Alabama day, torrential downpour. <laughs> You had that grass race and this really tight photo and like lightning striking behind her. Everybody's been told to go inside. And she like, she's like, I'm doing the post-race interview. And then she's on the racetrack and I literally, I got off the set and I'm sprinting out of there to go find a covered patio to watch the race at. And she's on the racetrack. Mm -hmm. And later in, later in this show, when she interviews Manny after Tiz is winning the Travers is really cool. And she, uh, and we talk about how, you know, there were no fans in the venue, but there were fans across the street at that horseshoe bar. And she brings attention to that as they were applauding Manny and Tissa Law as they were galloping back. It's very cool. I had bacon and eggs at, at the horseshoe on a day that I won't tell you when it is and had a beer, a Dos Equis before 10 a.m. And if you want to judge me, that's that's on you. Again, Sarah, Saratoga is just a college town. Why? Oh, I was so hungry. Long, long time ago. We've just accepted it now. <laughs> you know, from a horse player standpoint, I think this is one of the the the, the uh, airplane, the Windstar cam came in handy here because there's a lot of conversation about whether or not Venetian Harbor should have pressured Gamine early. And if you look here, you will realize why Joel did what he did because I think he had instructions to go to the front but he wasn't really getting past her. And when you get the, the blimp view, the, the plane view, and you get the head on, you'll realize that Johnny as a hall of famer kept Joel in the, like the nine path in, in the entire time. It was a brilliant ride by Johnny on the best horse. There you see it there that what you're talking about, Jonathan. And she's how, never going to let him over. How she has it that, that you don't quite get. So you have the head on there. The pan, but the overhead really um, accentuating how far out they are in the center of the racetrack. Very hard to see that in the. Uh, very hard to see that in the pan. Yeah, and at this point, as a as a television crew, we're rooting for Gamine and we're rooting for Tiz Law. We want those superstars in the sport. We want to tell their stories. And we knew if they, if Gamine wins here, 
and Tizzle all wins in the Traverse. They're going to go on to be the favorites in the Oaks and the Derby. And obviously things didn't work out well those days for them. But that's what we're hoping for is those stories that we build up to come through and uh, and really entertain the viewer. And it's, it's how she wins. It's not just that she wins. She follows up that 18 and three quarter length one in the Acorn with this tour de force. And yeah, how, how special is this? How good is this filly? Um, her future still so inexperienced. And I thought, I thought overall, collectively, we did a, a, a good job of, of expressing to someone who doesn't follow on a day-to-day -day basis, like you're, you're seeing an absolute budding of a superstar. Yeah, no, and, and and like you, we talked about a little bit earlier. Coming up here in a few seconds, you're gonna get uh, you're gonna get Maggie getting a microphone right in Johnny's face to talk about um, how good she is, and uh, it was fun. I think I think it worked out perfectly perfectly being able to see her run in this race prior to uh, prior to Tizza Law. By day's end, we had a chance, you know, in a ninety minute broadcast. Uh, to see two of the most exciting thoroughbreds in the sport 35 minutes apart. Um, and I mean, uh, definitely two of the two of the greatest performances we saw this summer. I mean, they're definitely in the top three. Yeah, and, uh, Maybe yeah, now, any impress, we missed her. The fact is besides the point, but self-contained for this particular show, right then, the these were two horses just – gets the blood pumping. So, you know, we were very fortunate that they happened to be on that particular broadcast and it helped make it that much more exciting of a story to tell. T, I know, I don't know. I remember, I thought we talked about it, but I don't remember exactly what we talked about. Did Was there some conversation of trying to get the Serengeti Empress race with Tom in the mix? And, yeah. and it obviously would have turned out to be awesome um, if we would have had that in the mix. I don't know if I would have traded it for this. I mean, I, I guess we could have traded it for the way um, but what was the conversations like and why, why was it ultimately, do we decide to, to not do that? So, uh, I'm, I'm only hearing it's, I, I only heard it secondhand. I'm not, I'm not a firsthand part of that conversation, but, um, I know one of the things was, um, they wanted to have a turf race in the show and on the later, you know, the later sequence of the racing. Um, yeah, I mean that, that I think was the primary reason. Uh, Makes sense. I know, I know there was some back and forth. Uh, there was some talk and there was some pull from one side to try to get it so we could get Serengeti Empress, Gamin, Tis the Law, and again, build up those superstars. Um, but ultimately, they, they gave us, basically, they, they gave us two out of three. Yeah, you know, it would have been cool. It would have been great. You know, obviously, it would have been tricky. Um, Lafitte, I don't know if you would have been by yourself at the desk for the first, you know? Yeah, that came up as a possibility. I want to remember that um, as far as logistics that I was... We were going to have to, I would open up the show by myself because Tom would still be tending to Serengeti Empress. So I remember that being a, a, a possibility. And yeah, you, you, you roll with it and explain it to the viewer. I'd introduce you to my analyst right now, but uh, there he is. Maybe we have a shot of him with Serengeti Empress. You know, um, you don't try to disguise it. You just, you just handle it if that's, uh, you know, if that's, the, if that's the scenario you're presented with. There's that, that angle again and watching Gamine pull away. Um, and seeing Maggie horseback talking to Johnny V and the same with Donna brothers on NBC, um, that stuff, the immediate reaction, because once the jockey gets back to the winner's circle, you know, of course they're still excited. They've just won a major race. It's a special moment, but that immediate response when the adrenaline is still going, the response you get from the rider in those moments that it adds so much to the broadcast. Is that a live you shot right there, T? Yeah, that's a, uh... Can you guys hear me? I switched my headphone situation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was running low on battery here. So yeah, that was um, one of our camera operators that, you know, we basically had him positioned out between Barkley tags barn and where we would be able to pick up that walkover shot from the tower camera. So basically we wanted coverage of Tis the law from the time he left the barn through the race. Um, and yeah, we had a uh, gentleman, I believe his name was Greg or Gary, uh, uh, who was out there operating that camera just, uh, staking out, waiting for Tis the Law. Yeah, I'm sorry, T. I know you're you've been busy, but uh, Greg uh, is Greg Wolf is is one of our other hosts, and Gary is a Hall of Fame writer, so it's probably somebody else, but not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that who those guys are? I thought Greg was running the camera. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, I, I think coming up is 
uh, I think Lafitte, you're about to do the, are you about to do the, this is not the reset. This is the historical piece, right? With funny side. Is that Greg? Greg that handle that. So my first question was, and we're going to get to it in a second. There's an old TV sitting in the stands. Who, who coordinated that? Is that, did we, is that our shot? We did that. Yeah, that was actually, um, uh, that was Noah, who was one of our, one of those freelance editors we hired for special days on the meet. And he said he, uh, he basically handled shooting that and said he had an idea just to put kind of the old images in that old TV and oh, that's really cool. it worked out well. So that's coming up here in a little bit. I want to highlight this guy in the background with the green shirt and the mask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what he was doing. Um, Shout out to Jimmy Barnes who ended up getting uh, breaking some bones the last next time we saw him on TV. Yeah, no. um, oh. 2020 encompassed in uh, between <laughs> him and his injury and then authentic losing his mind in the winner's circle of the Kentucky Derby. And you saw Acacia talking to Jimmy. Um, they, they got so good at it's because I didn't do an interview this summer at Saratoga, right? I didn't do my first interview I did that we were dealing with these new parameters during the pandemic wasn't until I went to Churchill for Oaks and Derby. And it's, it's awkward when you're dealing with that boom mic moving back and forth and, and Maggie and, and, and Acacia, they got, they they were so fluid with it and the timing of which after a while it didn't become awkward to watch that type of interview is how, is how comfortable they got with it. Um, we just saw, I, I teased it earlier. Uh, we'll get Craig to back it up just a couple seconds to where you are. Well, what's, what's going on with this pin? Lafitte? tell me about this pin. My, what, I, my what, dad used to have what those. pin. It's the pin with like the, uh, the four different colors on it. A, like a, writer writer. Pen. a what? A pen. Yeah. Yeah. Like a pin, yeah, like a writing. Pin. Pen. I'm like, I never have a pin on for this show. So no, this, so we have so many people on the show, right? Each of you and this pen, I don't care how retro or geeky it is. Each of you have an assigned color. So you or Acacia or Maggie or Andy, if you say something during the course of the broadcast that I think might be applicable in terms of following up that information as a result of how the race is run, I can write that down. And as opposed to looking for who wrote it, I color codenate you guys so that I can follow that up with as opposed to somebody said that, but I'm not quite sure who it is. Last year, I remember running into that because we look at how many people are on the show, like 22 Keeping track of everything and what everybody says, it gets a little bit tricky. So that I assigned each of you a color, hence the uh, pen with the uh, nine different colors with on it. Look, I will send your ass to to, to human resources if my color is black. Um, you know, then you can send me <laughs> human resources. Like whatever you know, whatever <laughs> word association. <laughs> All right, fair enough. All right, we can let it run here. I think the 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 Greg tease is coming up. I wanted to look at. Um, I I thought it was. I mean, it was really good too. It just kind of it kind of brought you back. I know Luffy, you like a lot of those history runs too. Just kind of putting it into perspective, like what all this means. Like what you know. That's one of the things I've I've picked up from from the way that T produces shows, the way you host shows, the way Greg hosts shows. Is that there's there's something to that explaining to people why they should care because i obviously care regardless i think in order to you know appreciate today you have to understand what happened yesterday um this horse this race so much of it is 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 the history that adds to the importance and the prestige of these events um and greg did a great job and you'll see the feature introducing the piece reacting to it and applying that later when he spoke with uh when we spoke with barkley when he spoke with Jack Knowlton and, and the Sakatoga team, um, watching that piece again, you had a little bit more of a reason to, to maybe celebrate or cheer what you had just watched his law do, understanding what it meant to those people close to him. So it looks like yeah, uh, there's a line in that feature that the, there's a line in that feature where Jack Knowlton says, um, he says that, you know, we, Sakatoga stable, what does he say? Sakatoga stable, uh, won the triple crown it took us two horses in 17 years to do it that's why people should care like this small time ownership group accomplished this amazing feat they just did it in you know over 17 years with two different horses the same reason the dodgers winning the world series was so significant this year the the fact that it hadn't been done in 32 years 1988 
uh, or when American Pharaoh won the Triple Crown. That, that long drought always adds a little bit more because you know it it means more to the people closest to whether it's in, involved in a sports franchise or in this case, people are close to a, a horse. The, the, the waiting is going to make the, the accomplishment that much more significant. I think I can see where Lafitte lived this summer. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't it up there? You know what? <laughs> you know, oh, you can, is that is that you up there in the like at the top, right? So I'm trying to figure out is this the is this the Saratoga Hilton right here in the upper right? I can't tell. I, if it is, you wouldn't be able to see where I was at, but I was really close to the racetrack. Yeah, I was right yeah, up. Well, that's good. It's, it's another beautiful, another beautiful shot. Oh, uh, that's, and before, uh, no, that's Congress. That's Congress, Congress Park, Park right in the middle. Yeah, so I think yeah. I can see Salevo and and Danny too, right? Everything looks like Salevo to you at this point. Hey, which is trying to get there as often as possible. Uh, here's what I will say um, before we get, before we roll it. Um, uh, what was I going to? Uh, damn, I can't remember now. Just run it. Uh, I'm going to step aside just for a sec. Give me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do your thing. Yeah, do your thing. Um, I thought I had something clever to say. I can't remember what it was now, so it must not have been that clever. You can go ahead, Craig. We'll hit it. Oh, this, oh, is this, cool. was, this was really good. Yeah. No, I feel like I, I feel like Lafitte should be here for this one. Yo, you pause this one, Craig? Yeah. This gonna... is where Lafitte makes his little clever joke. He's like, let's embarrass him with the uh, with the baby pictures. <laughs> I feel like a nerd. I'm watch I'm laying on the couch. I've already seen this three times, and I like giggled at it when he did it today. <laughs> <laughs> um T, at this point, are you feeling like you're downhill yet? Or are you still like, oh, let me get this Travers right? <laughs> Uh, so I wasn't quite downhill yet because horses were just making their way into the paddock. Uh, and obviously one of the biggest things with my job is timing. So I was worried about the, we still had to get the, uh, Sakatoga feature in. We have the retees to get in. We have the jockey intro to get in all these elements that have to get in Oh, and a, a Maggie paddock report, all these elements that have to get in before a post parade. So at this point I'm getting kind of nervous looking at the watch figuring out do i have to kill something are these all these elements going to get in uh, this is where you know if you're supposed to go 30 seconds and you go 45 seconds this is where it makes a difference uh so i'm still a little bit anxious at this point so i think the the, the i remember what i wanted to say earlier um the jockey intros last year obviously there was an ambitious idea to, to kind of have them come out of the smoke out of the room and and it's just it's just hard to do from a timing standpoint and not having the appropriate amount of bodies and the tech to be able to do it. Um, but I thought you hit an absolute home run this year. I mean, I, I loved it. I watched it again today. I thought it was awesome. I mean, I, I think it's super, super cool. Yeah, I loved it. it was, we kind of uh, we kind of got lucky with that. Uh, last year, as mentioned, we tried to do the live intros, and it worked well on Alabama Day. And then when we tried to do it on Traverse Day, uh, it, it, the timing was a little off. So uh, this year, with no fans, the, the, the jockey intros weren't going to have the same effect, the same feel to it. So uh, we decided to pre-produce them. Uh, the initial thought was to do something maybe green screen and with some stats or graphics like you might see on like Monday Night Football on the side. Um, and then after talking to uh, those freelance editors, we had talked about the one, one guy said, you know what, I just got done shooting something for uh, the University of Albany, their basketball team. And he goes, let me show it to you. And if you like it, we'll do it with the jockeys. And he showed it to me. I was like, I fell in love with it right away. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. So that's what we had to coordinate with the jocks room. And uh, I think we shot it. So this obviously was on a Saturday. I think we shot it like on that Thursday, just two days before the Traverse. And then uh, the editors put it all together. Lafitte, I was telling before you, when you write, when you ran away, that uh, that when you did the, uh, the the baby picture joke was very good. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, isn't that? I mean, parents with small children, and you know, it's like it's look at the baby, look at the baby, you know. Um, <laughs> and when you're a little bit older, and when mom and dad might be like showing baby pictures, it can be a little bit embarrassing. Um, but it, I thought that was a fun way to kind of, for tis the law, you know. People love, you know, seeing what they look like when they were little. Like an athlete, you'll see it on coverage of a major, any major sporting event. Yeah, there's the old TV. 
seeing the athlete yeah. have a great shot. Um, seeing the athlete when they're younger, watching them grow up, and the significance of the fact that this law had focus Maiden on the very same day, the travesty of really awesome. Empire Maker has won the 135th Belmont State. By the really cool. Checked in third this year. Tis the law. And as a new racing, like a younger racing fan, like, and I don't mean young in age. I mean young in in, in my love for it is 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 uh you know I'm I'm going on 20 years right where others is 40 and 50. This is kind of a this I didn't really know a lot about Funny Side. My my first derby of real memory was um was like. I don't know, Giacomo. That was like my may, maybe. Uh, who's two thousand four? Maybe two thousand four was my first one. Smarty. Smarty was my Smarty first Jones. memory. Smarty was my first memory. So, hearing this story was. I, I just I love stuff like this. Man. It really, it's it's why our our sport is so special, in my opinion. Absolutely love to win it. And to have have people like Jack Knowlton, have owners, trainers, jockeys, whoever they are, that'll take the time, let us, you know, put a microphone on him in the morning when he goes out to watch his law work uh, leading up to the Traverse. And uh, to have the access to the stars, to the uh, to the owners, to the trainers and jockeys, that's huge. Uh, and I know that they're all busy and they've got a lot of stuff going on, but to have that access makes these shows and this uh, the entertainment value of this to the viewer so much better. And Jack is so flexible with his time. I mean, he, he during this entire, you know, he's being pulled 18 different directions and different interview requests. And sometimes you ask someone to be there, you know, at two o'clock and we'll do the interview right then. Uh, and you don't get it to, until about 2.30 or so. Um, I, I've, he's, he stood, he's waited his patience and um, never, like he never um, get the sense that he's getting impatient he's so great with his time and, and the accessibility makes it that much easier to work with and uh, to you know convey and tell this story uh to the viewers the the, the public he was he was awesome to work with just two original members of that sakatoga group remain from those funny side Greg Stagger is really good this time around, 32 members bought shares in Atista Law, each at $7,500 a piece. Lafitte, I got a little bad news for you. If you're dreaming of buying into a Sacatoga's next Triple Crown contender, according to their website, there are no current opportunities available. I was going to use the uh, purse from uh, Tom's grade one win earlier this afternoon. <laughs> Funny side. There is a 2003 Derby Preakness winner, 20 years old, living the life at the uh, Kentucky Horse Park in Lexington. Funny side probably thinks he can beat Tis the Law like today. Tis the Law, another part of the Saratoga tradition, uh, the ringing of the bell. That's cool shot. the jockeys into the paddock. I didn't know they did this <laughs> until there was no fans there and I could hear it. <laughs> you've, never, you've never heard the bell before? I've never heard it. Yeah, that was one of those things that when we were planning this, and we were like, you know, there's no fans. But how do we still try to get a little atmosphere in the show? And that's that's one of the things we were like, we still gotta we gotta have that ringing of the bell before this. Luis right. I am from Panama. Uncle Shop. So good. Joel Rosario from Dominican Republic, mass player. Junior Alvarado, I'm from Venezuela, Chivari. My name is Manuel Franco. I'm coming from Puerto Rico, and I write this a lot. Manny's dad was like a champion boxer, by the way. Right? And like, you got to give Puerto Rico, South Bend. You got to give the riders because the the element it looks great. And you know, the idea is awesome, but if the riders superstar aren't as animated and don't want to bring it in the right element, it, it doesn't work. That moment, like, saw the they were, they were entering the paddock before a grade one run happened. Yeah, they were so good. It was so good. Um, so right here, um, I mean, this is such a great shot of just like the paddock at Saratoga. Obviously, there'd be a lot more people in there um, on a normal situation, but this was exciting. I, mean, I was excited to watch this horse run. And, it just and I, I love here too. We get Gary involved, and you know this is what Gary brings for our show that I feel like you can't really get anywhere else. Is you get a Hall of Fame jockey that has won every race known to man, 
and he can tell you exactly what those jockeys feel like right now. He's been there. He's done that. Uh, and that's that's why he's so valuable on the show. His firsthand experience in these big money, these big situations. Yeah, it's it's having been there, done it. One of the best to have ever put the white pants on and, and ride a uh, Hall of Famer. Obviously, it's it's that insight is 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 invaluable. He doesn't know. He doesn't know what's happening in the world. He won't miss the 45,000 people that should be here today. We will. But isn't that the beauty of this athlete? Contract disputes, no holdouts. And he doesn't care who's watching or cheering. He just loves to run. In a normal year, who knows? That win in the Belmont Stakes may be triple crown glory. A challenge still in Tis the Law's future. For now, everything is different. We know. I love that shot. For the next half hour, let's forget about everything else and embrace something that hasn't changed. This legendary race from this storied racing cathedral. As prestigious as ever, perhaps more needed than ever. Welcome to the 151st running of the Run Happy Traverse Stakes. Gorgeous. That's, that gets me going when they do that. Editors did That's the a point. Good job with that. The music that they chose. Um, yeah, I was I was really pleased with how that came out. When now, so that that was what we talked about earlier. What I I guess I, I got I thought the wrong thing. I thought the open, uh, the scene set. It, it was that you you uh, you got inspiration by like sitting up in the stands to kind of help you write that. Yeah, I was I, I really struggled trying to come up with the right with the right tone with to present an event that. Yes, we're all very excited about that it's going to take place, but it has to be very different than what a typical Travers tease is because it's not all hard hitting and fast and loud and in your face. And we've been telling the story for 90 minutes and it's post time. We are in a pandemic and we know that there are 45,000 people that should be here. Um, and while it's a distraction, of course, but you still don't want to be tone deaf to what's happening in, in the rest of the world. And while all this is happening, like the star of this show has no idea. The horse himself like couldn't care less, right? He's gonna go out there and no matter who's there, no matter what's happening, he just, he, he loves to run. Um, so yeah, I was at, uh, couldn't come up with anything. It was pouring, it was a Tuesday at Saratoga, so we were dark and just, um, I remember going into the, into the grandstand and just kind of sitting there by myself and watching and looking at everything. Um, recognizing how lucky I still felt to be here, that we were working, that we were racing, um, how different it is without the fans. I don't think there was a day that went by we didn't think about how much better that day would have been with the fans there. And uh, trying to encapsulate all these different elements that make this particular Travers so different. Um, and and that's, 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 what I, that's what I came up with. It's funny, this is a, a part where uh, Uncle Chuck is, um, He's hollering, you know, neighing, whatever. And you, you, you bring it up um, a little bit later in the post parade, but or in the warm ups. But during this point, because Baffert was at home watching, he texted me and he said, "Uncle Chuck is talking trash. That's what he's doing." And so I wanted to say that on the show, so I told T, <laughs> T, I, I got something. But it's just the show's so tight, I it just didn't work out where it could because it's just you know you can't just throw it to me at the desk and then I just say something and I disappear and just. And he didn't text me until after this hit, but it was uh, it was funny. But that would have been great, though. That yeah, obviously, great. it was it was discussed in the show that it, it can be a you know an, an unfocused racehorse, like maybe cause for concern. Uh, no, I just talked to his trainer. That's just Uncle Chuck being Uncle Chuck. Yeah. And then he ran up the track. He did. He's still running. <laughs> where did he, where did he finish? Uh. I don't want to say he ran up the track if he ran like second. No, because uh, Andy he wasn't second. second. Yeah, Kerry Caro. Caro ran yeah. second. Yeah. And I don't know. He's like maybe. I mean, I don't think he was third. I think he was probably fourth, fifth, or sixth. He wasn't. I don't think he was. Uh, as my twenty-five dollar win bet goes down the drain. <laughs> but to be fair, was this the race? Or was it Gamine that Andy stole your twenty-five dollar free play? No, remember we. Were, I, I think I was with you, T. We. I went by the truck on the way home. And uh, the graphics guy was like, what do you want your bet to be? And I was like, oh, I'll just give me a double. 
uh, Gamin to Tis the Law or Gamin to Uncle Chuck. He's like, oh, that's what Andy picked. And I was like, oh, okay, well, uh, <laughs> give me this instead. Yeah. So he did steal it from me. A shot um, of the blanket's cool too. Again, that's just kind of bringing that, bringing that tradition together and just showing the people at home that, you know, why this race means so much. It, you know, it's not just a blanket of, uh, of flowers. It's somebody's hard work that goes into that. That's given right. you the winner every year. We were getting tight on time here, T, and I know that uh, it's not soon after this that it is soon after this. At some point, we lose communication, but we came back. We did this post parade and then had to get right back to break, which was unconventional. But you're, you know, the play you play the hand you're dealt. Yeah, and, uh, thankfully though, I think the the break after this, if I'm not mistaken, was only a 60 second break, and that was, uh, I think, by design uh, from our sales team, the you know selling a a break after the post parade, but it, but it's brief. And at this point, Jonathan had asked me earlier, at what point do you kind of feel like you're going downhill and coasting home? And like at this point, all the elements are out of the way. It's just mm -hmm. the horses and it's just your opinions, the, the, the analysts giving their opinions. So my job becomes a lot easier at this point. Um, but as a racing fan, this is where you start getting the butterflies and you're excited to see Will Tis the Law run his race today. Will Uncle Chuck or Kara Caro upset him? And yeah, this is where it starts getting fun. And the hard work going to break. That was a good, that was a good choice for uh, a bump to a break there. Just the, and those, uh, the shots, the motion, really well done. I figured you could handle hosting for a second, Lafitte. <laughs> I got so cold sweat, man. Look at that. I think he was hosting, not me. Job staging that. Um, yeah, we were. You're right. We were a little. Uh -oh. We ended up getting a little tight on time at this point, which is expected. It happens. Happens with these shows, and even though it says one minute to post, we know that it's you know it's really four or five minutes, whatever it might be to post, but. Uh, for instance, Acacia's interview coming up here with Chad Brown. Uh, ideally, she would have gotten a second question in. We had to wrap her a little quick. Uh, but it was, and, it, you know, it was the right question though, and then it was important to hear from Chad. I thought, especially because if he does win, we hadn't have heard from him, and we've built up how important this race is to him. I thought that was necessary in the right call. Right. Correct. Yeah. yeah I, so I think that's important too. Um, tease that that although there was one minute to post, you had the real off. You knew the real off time yeah. um all week yeah they we have a that's one of those meetings we have like on monday or tuesday or whatever that week and it's like all right this is going to be the post time this is going to be the off time uh and it's kind of cool because uh you even go into detail of uh ask the, the paddock judge asks you what time do you want the horses to step onto the track for the post parade and that's up to us to kind of decide you know i mean obviously within reason but it's okay if Post times 5.45, off times 5.48, I want them to hit the track at 5.36. And it's down to that minute that we're trying to time all of this. I, I think it's funny. This is a time we should probably mention last year. We should give our our uh, the brilliance of, of our boss, Tony Alivato, some credit. i the same thing. <laughs> if, if people who, who watched last year, you'll remember that there was run happy signs on the turf course. And the jockeys wanted us to – wanted the production to take them down because they were worried the horses would be distracted because they're not there normally. I'll let, I'll let you guys tell the rest of that story. Yeah, what was it like was, in the truck, Terrence? I wanted, what was it like in the truck when that was going down? Oh, God. So it, it was, as you mentioned, it was our boss Tony's idea. And, you know, he, he was very proud of that idea. And I think still to this day is, and they, uh, they were circling. And I remember, I think it was Andy was the first one that brought it to my attention. Andy goes, uh, Terrence, there's a problem, but he didn't know what the problem was. He just knew something was going on that the race wasn't going to go off as scheduled. And he's like, Terrence, there's a problem. And I'm just starting to freak out. I'm like, Oh, well, what do you mean? What's the problem? And Andy's like, I don't know, but they're still circling. They should be going in the gate. I don't know what's going on. So then we went to Maggie. And I think if I remember correctly from that year, Maggie then reported that Johnny V and the jockeys collectively said that they weren't going to ride with those signs up. So then the, the grounds crew comes running out and just 
literally stamping the run happy signs down into the turf course and the crowd the the 45,000 that were in attendance cheering them on as they ran down the turf course. This is hysterical. I, I just I blamed Gary and Tom. I said it was their idea. I told them it was a horrible idea. They were hell bent on doing it, and you know, they've almost you know just ruined the travers. <laughs> So it helped with handle. Yeah, they got yeah, 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 extra we're minutes. Over this. What's that? Said so it helped with handle. They got a couple extra minutes. Uh, of course, all by design. <laughs> yeah, this was this was good hearing from Chad. But I and there's a back, I appreciated the attention times here, where I can tell this like I did not. This is where we lost communication, and I'm like I, I'm not going wherever I, I'm not throwing to someone or checking with you. I don't think I got back to you guys on the desk or whatever it may have been, and had no idea that that Terrence couldn't. Couldn't talk to me. And, and uh, to kind of compliment Lafitte here, like Lafitte has a rundown and follows it so well, and he's so prepared that he could probably have just gone to the next segment and thrown to Andy and Jonathan without my direction. But as he mentioned earlier in this podcast, he, you still don't want to just go with that pitch until you know it's okay. Because well, knows it's Andy not Because I know going. you're going to tell me, like they're, they're red. You're going to tell me. You're, it would be very odd, especially on this show. For you to just, oh, he had like assumed that I know that I'm supposed to go to them next, you know. So when I didn't hear from you, I stuck going, just, you know, you stretch and you stretch and you stretch. It's just a really inopportune time for that to happen. Yeah. And here's some more great analysis from Maggie. This is just, I think, having her out there on the horseback is just very, very valuable. No, it really, I mean, that's what Maggie brings to the table though, right? Is like, she can get, she can get to places that we can't get and tell us things that I couldn't tell myself if I was, you know what I mean? Like, I can't she, talk about that. no, she just gives us access that, and, 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 and no one else does it like she does it. So it's, you know, she does a phenomenal job. You did a great medic report last year, Jonathan, and it was on Travis <laughs> day. You're like, you're right. Four, you're four right. legs, a tail. A jockey. I think we were, I think we were talking over the point though. That one of my favorite parts of this show is when Greg had spoke to Barkley Tag, and he said, uh, he said yeah, I spoke to Barkley Tag, and I asked him if he was worried about like the mile, the extra distance or whatever." And Barkley's response was just, well, "Where would you run him?" <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I would, I would, if he would have asked me, I'd have said, "I don't ran him in the Allen Jerkins, sir." <laughs> and, and this wasn't. I'm glad that this was in for John Embryo getting ready to. First full season as the as yeah. the voice of Saratoga and getting a quick shot of him there that you know calling was that live T that shot no comment <laughs> I thought it was no it was not live we recorded earlier in the day it was just it was that was that, that, that was that yeah, I mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah going back to Johnny I though I mean I the three years I've been at Naira. There's not a nicer person in the building. Love Johnny right. I. And when he comes down and tells stories with Mitch, our director, or Richie Migliori, like just story time with Johnny I is great. I got to the bottom of who's yelling no, 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 no all the time on my last podcast. Who is it? It's, it's, it seems like it's one of the outcasts of the starting group. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Sounds about right. <laughs> that's the shot that we had to, you know you have to set up a podium and like literally has to be constructed and built to put the camera on i love that shot is there an operator there yeah yeah Shot Shivery is next in second. Tis the law on the outside in third. The opening quarter 23 and three fifth seconds. Country grammar is down. At the so at this point, we're, uh, I'm thinking if Tis the law wins, Greg is with Jack Knowlton. Uh, Acacia is potentially looking for Barkley Tag if she can, you know, get him to talk at that point. Um, you got a camera on, I believe it was um, Robin Smallin, and you'll see a reaction shot from her after the race. So, so you're setting up the cameras. For catch them that off. moment after victory, yeah. Now, does is this is this uh, Danny Glow or Mitch that are flipping the cuts, or is that you telling them let's go to the blimp, let's go to the? It's all it's all Mitch. Mitch is directing. Um, yeah, he when it's race time, I let them cut. I'm worried about other things. I'm I'm telling the directors which which shots to take. <laughs> 
Look what at, are you doing right now, Lafitte? Just watching the race intently? Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm, you don't want to miss anything. So I'm watching this. Um, and then this is often also when Terrence and I will be, you know, communicating. But this is, you know, the table is set. You're about, you can see what's unfolding and everything that's gone into the show, the story that we've told. Here's the payoff. And from a television standpoint, while I'm not betting, I'm not rooting, this is what I'm rooting for. Look at that. Someone who's never watched a horse race in their life can look at that and say, wow, he made that look easy. Love the celebration. reaction shots. You want the celebration. You want all that. Yeah. There was like, there was like a hands-free, hands-free high fives. <laughs> <laughs> and let's say, let's say Tiz the Law didn't run. And let's say Country Grammar looked like he was going to win. Then you immediately, you tell the camera guy, find Chad Brown, go find Chad Brown. Cause you want that reaction shot, but you're kind of putting, putting your eggs in this Tiz the Law basket. But if you're at the eighth pole and you think he's going to lose and you call a quick audible. Tom's post race was excellent. Yeah. Gary's as well. He just looks back right there. What a big time finish for what I think is going to be one of the biggest favorites in Kentucky Derby modern time history. He was right. Beautiful. Yep. Franco starts celebrating about a 16th of a mile out. Yeah, he did. And I would have been too. Uh, this race was over with uh, before they got into the first turn. He had him positioned in a, in a great spot. He literally just galloped this horse around that racetrack. He never even had to hit the afterburners. He didn't start into fifth gear. Yeah, and here's the Robin Smolin shot. She's crying. And, She's crying. You know, just very emotional. Mm -hmm. No, it's brilliant. Greg does a great job here with them. Thank you very much here with Jack Norton, the main man behind Sakatoga. Congratulations. You've lived in this town now for over 35 years. What does this win mean when you tried to get in this race 17 years ago and weren't able to with Funny Side? It's just so exciting, uh, you know, to be in the race, be one to two. There's a lot of pressure, believe me. I know on me, on Barkley, we've had well wishes from everywhere. We saw a performance today that uh, just blows me away. I mean, we know we got a nice horse. We thought we had the best horse, but to do what he did today, we're looking forward to going to Kentucky now. Yeah, next stop, Kentucky Derby. Let's go to Maggie Wolfendale. Oh, wow. What a cool experience. You know, we don't have spectators here, but they were cheering for you, Manny, on the outside fence over at the horseshoe and everything. This is Saratoga and New York's horse. Manny, what a feeling you have right now. Man, I, I, I can't explain how I feel right now. I feel all the support was there, even with no crowd, but I feel everybody is watching me. Man, I want to say thanks to Jack Nelson, the owner, the trainer, Barkley, Robin, Juan, the groom, and Heather for, for a great job with this horse. And Manny, I mean, you are the up-and-comer. You're the younger guy in the room. There's Hall of Famers in there. How much, is it, much does it mean to you that they've stuck by you with such a talented three-year-old colt? It means a lot because they made me be a better jockey to have this opportunity. So... I'm here for that. Manny, what wise words from such a young man. Congratulations with Tis the Law. Thank you, Maggie. Oh, the guys, that was mm. such a cool experience from being out here on the racetrack with a horse that, uh, I mean, has just been everybody's hero. And now he's a Travers hero. Maggie, thanks so much. The uh, Windstar. So yeah. I was just going to touch on one thing real quick. My, I got chills just watching that. And I yeah, think I've too. watched the show about I think I've watched the show about eight times since Traverse Day, and every time I get excited, even though I know the result. And uh, I talk to my brother a lot about sports, and it's the emotion in sports that keeps us all watching, right? And it's good emotion, bad emotion, right? If Tizzle Law had lost, and uh, capturing that negative emotion is just as important. And, you know, it's that, that uh, what's it called, the agony of defeat, or the, uh, the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. And just to experience this thrill of victory through these connections is, gives me chills. It's it's odd watching that interview though now knowing what's happened since right I know I know I I, I it, mm -hmm. exactly exactly the fact that and and if you're not familiar obviously um, Manny Franco has been taken off since uh, of Tis the Law and Johnny Velasquez will ride Tis the Law on the Pegasus and moving forward in 2021 so it, this this beautiful moment it, it's it's a little bit uh, a little bit uh, uh, kind of 
tainted out. <laughs> just from what we know now. You do, it just feels a little bit different watching watching it back. One of the things I will say that I really appreciate, and, and I know that you guys all appreciate this too, is, is him thanking Juan, the groom. Uh, it says a lot about Manny as a young man and, and, and his attention to detail. These kids make a lot of money. Um, they're out there risking their lives, so I, I, I'm not saying they don't deserve it. But to, to have the foresight to, to, to think about someone – like that really doesn't have any impact on whether or not Manny's on this horse or not. And for him in that moment to think about Juan, the groom, says a lot about him as a young man. Thoughtful. And he handled all of this um, so well. It was a good, you know, Andy liked Caracaro second at, at big price. Um, after the Belmont, after the Travers. And you would understand that maybe a rider – would feel a little bit short changed. I want the Belmont Stakes. I want a Travers, and, and this is supposed to be done in that electric atmosphere with tens of thousands of people. And on both occasions, he said it didn't feel any different to me. Not that he had anything to compare it to, but he didn't feel like he was missing out on anything because he knew everybody was watching. He could feel the support, and, and it was the same. He expressed that very sentiment after the Belmont and and the Travers. And yeah, it, it says a lot about man. Well, as we as it wraps here, um, you know, I want to take the time to ask both of you guys, just in general. You know, I know we, you know, I know exactly, especially you two. I mean, I'm a little bit less than you guys, <laughs> but I know that when these shows are over, you guys look back and think about all the things you wish you would have done differently, all the mistakes that you made, how you can be better next time. What are some of the things after watching this? Oh, that was fun, hanging out at that uh, at the uh, at the little cove there in Saratoga. Um, but what are some of the things that you, you guys kind of wish you would have done differently? Things that mistakes that you, you wish you could take back that maybe the, the viewers might not have even noticed. Terrence like screwed up a lot during that show. So I'll let him answer first. <laughs> I was going to say, let him answer first. Uh, so I think more, this, I have a very technical answer to things. Um, in the truck, there was a, a couple of times we crossed each other up, almost like a pitcher and catcher in baseball, where uh, calling for certain video elements or graphic elements that were maybe uh, called incorrectly. Um, I think that the way we label things in the truck, I mean, I know that's probably boring for the listeners and the viewers. But that was the first thing, like that night, I was thinking about that for the next year's show, um, about being a little bit more specific about how we label everything. From a from a uh, uh, element perspective, I, I mean, Honestly, from an element perspective, I don't know how much I would change. I could, those are the stories that we wanted to tell. We got lucky that they came through, that Tizalaw came through to put a bow on the box of all of those stories. And Greg's interview with Jack, you know, tied up that storyline throughout everything. Um, other than other than some technical things that would probably be pretty boring to everybody, I, I don't know that I would change anything content-wise. I think I could have um, reset storylines a little bit more uh, as they were going into the gate. Again, at that point, um, there, there was, we, I'd lost communication there um, with Terrence. And, and as the horses were filing, as they were moving in, I think I could have reset that just one more time, why you care while you're watching. And another one was um, getting back to Gamine. It was a scenario where, you know, Bob Baffert had had the four positives, I believe, over or maybe it was three positives back then over an extended period of time. And we got a little bit jammed up traffic wise and I didn't get a chance. And I probably could have found a spot to explain that, that what had gone, what had happened with Gamine, that one of her races, she was disqualified. It wasn't for any legal substance. It was a legal substance, just over the, just in overage, just to check the box so that somebody watching who knows better, it's not that it's just Afford has a horse in the race. It's, it's her. It's, it's Gamine. So we got backed up with traffic a little bit, didn't get a chance to check that box. And then after the race, went ahead and addressed it, but, but it felt like I was trying to, to just kind of jam a square peg into a round hole at that very point um she had won i'm glad that it was addressed to a certain extent um and that we were able to again to, to check that box but i'm disappointed i didn't find a spot pre-race uh to to, to make the, to explain that yeah I, mean, I thought you addressed it i mean i thought you, you called it like it was you know it was a it was a, an overage of a legal substance and 
they were they were uh, and then you uh, the beautiful part is that you pointed out that in the acorn uh she was it was clean so right, right. Um, her, her most devastating performance and it was squared away there so um i was fine that we had i, I thought of one, i thought of one last thing go ahead sorry uh, content wise one last thing i wish we would have heard from manny before the race uh, so he didn't ride. Uh, he didn't ride in the test. He rode in that way. Uh, so I wish we could have gotten Acacia to maybe get a quick interview with Manny outside the jocks room. We could have heard from him, even if it's just one question uh, leading up to that race. And uh, the the problem and a good problem to have is that the, that race right before the Traverse was a grade one with a superstar in and of itself. So we devoted a lot of time to that race coverage. Um, if we could have snuck in a quick little hit with Manny, that would have, uh, I think, kind of enhanced that story. What parts were you guys uh, the most proud of? I'll, I'll say um, I thought the visual presentation um, was 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 awesome. You know, I just it just it looked good. The show looked good. The the shots looked good. Having the 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 overhead cam with the with the plane, I thought all that stuff felt good. If I was sitting at home um, watching, I would have really really been happy about that. So I, I thought the the visual was great. Um, what are some of the things you guys are, are proud of uh, from the production? Go ahead. Tim. I, th I think um, uh, it's on this show as well as what we do day in and day out. It's just the, I mean, it sounds very cliche, but it's that overall team effort. We talked about how, uh, you know, we're, we're a, we're a Naira production crew putting on a show on network cable. And in this case, you know, network television, and in my opinion, doing a wonderful job. Um, and it's, it takes, 30 to 40 people to put that show together. Um, and I think, um, I, I think afterward coming out and having everybody just with smiles on their faces and being relieved that it was successful and that it went mostly the way we wanted it to go. I think, uh, you know, I feel like, uh, I feel like a member of a football team. We just scored a touchdown and we're all, you know, giving high fives on the sideline. So. I agree. That's a high wire act. That's a, undermanned Naira television crew doing an incredible job, the heavy lifting that goes on beyond the, behind the scenes um, for that show to be uh, on Fox again with, with virtually no rehearsal collectively. Um, I thought it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was the effort in itself and really pleased with the, with the finished product. It was awesome. It was fun to be on. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an honor to be involved. Obviously, you know, I think, uh, Lafitte, you've you've had your opportunity to do a lot of you know kind of big races and and uh, for me it's just been it's just been so cool to be involved in those. As, as someone who used to uh, watch all of your shows, it's 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 fun to work with you. It's more fun to have you as a friend. Same with UT to have you as a friend. It's it's great. Um, our working relationships fun and, and and being able to work with you guys is awesome. But but uh, the eight hours at Druthers was was the highlight of my summer. So I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate you guys and, and, and helping me along too, man. It's just like you guys make my job easier. Wolfie, um, Lafitte, Terrence, Evan, Bobby. Uh, the behind the scenes people is what make it easier for us. Is, is as I don't even like to use the word talent like when I'm telling other people, but like as people that are like on the show, it it makes it so much easier. And and I think. I wanted people to kind of understand that what we do every day, there's a lot more to it, you know, and I wanted to show this show and, and I wanted to highlight obviously the work that you did Terrence on this show. I know how important it is to you and, and uh, this being kind of the crown jewel of our entire TV year. Um, you should be very proud of the product that you put out for the, for us to execute and for the viewers to see. So I wanted to make sure to highlight you in that regard. Well, thank you, man. All right, guys. And what? And you? And you're in your You're a quick study. You make it look easy yourself, Jonathan. You're a, you're a quick study. You're a, um, I'm trying. I'm trying my hardest. Um, I mean, I appreciate you guys taking the time. This is a ton of fun. I usually do this long, drawn out goodbye uh, on my podcast, but but uh, just for the sake of you guys not having to sit there and stare at me, I'll just be quick and say uh, uh, thanks for everybody for listening. Um, retweet, tweet, share, favorite, like, whatever, all that stuff. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. I need to know everything, who and the what and the where, I need everything Trust me, I hear what you're saying, but I like it's new what you're telling me 
I'm curious, George. I hop in the Porsche. Five and a horse. I'm ready for war. I'm coming for throws to turn to a ghost.